Let me uh, clear my throat. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, great. I know. Fantastic. <laughs> the baby and the baby. The baby of the baby with the baby. Babies cry. The baby. Babies cry. Find a spot around the fireplace, you goons. It's time for another tale of Casual Master Quest. Aloha, everybody. Come on in. The fire is welcoming. There's dusty furniture to sit on. Get campy. Get comfortable. West Hall is over in the back where all the challenges will be given by myself, Tyler. With a metaphorical rose in his mouth and a glimmer in his eyes, here is Nick, our beautiful guild poster boy. Hello. Welcome to the gu- what ge- guild hall? Welcome to the guild hall. Oh, you do. It. You're going to say you had one job. You, you, I had one job. You I, both I, I had just, one job. I understand you had a metaphorical rose in your mouth and you're trying to talk through it. But well, on. you know what happens with uh, with roses and thorns is that, you know, they prick you and you So you got like a really bloody fun. greeting going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And making sure our guild doesn't go into immediate bankruptcy and the Vita powered lights stay on. Our treasurer watches carefully from the shadows. Cam. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? Okay, this is Casual Master Quest number 12, the only podcast whose treasurer will enter a burning building to save a PlayStation Vita. Would you actually do that? Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> like, it, like uh, no. I'm kind of curious now, like on your point of view, how that would work. So consoles, as I said before, consoles are more important than human life. So considering that, right? Anyone yeah, who this before. Yeah, anyone who'd run in to save a baby, for example, you know, oh no, my baby's stuck in the fire. You got to run and save him. Me for a Vita. Now, I would say originally I'd probably get the Vita out beforehand, but no, I'd, I'd run into a hurting building. Yeah, I, I just because, imagine because you're yeah, with the storm factor. You can just slip into your pocket as you run exactly. out. Exactly, it's much easier than baby. baby. Babies are unwieldy and you know a little awkward. So, I imagine yeah. you walking down the sidewalk. You see a burning fire. Uh, Firefighters are just shooting like crazy at this thing. All of a sudden, you hear the, the low battery notification of the PlayStation Vita, and you're like, "I must save it." <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> The Vita lives, and you jump face first. <laughs> uh, I can, I can see it. Okay, so how's everybody doing? Good. It's good. It's good. A little rush getting here. It was definitely down to the wire for me. Yeah, no I'm, kidding. We had a I'm, wild week. Did we? I think. Well, I did. Uh, <laughs> had a, uh, I had a family member pass away, and that oh, was. Right, yes. yeah, I know. I bring that one up. Ugh. It was well, that's it for the show, folks. Yeah, have a good. I know, right? I I love bringing the mood way up and then just skyrocketing it down just to see what happens. Uh, so far, we're flatlining. Nick, what's been going on over on your end? Um, I'm alive. You More are alive. alive. This that week, is the last week. Last week. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, just school. Um, if it's finals are right around the corner, starting in a few weeks. Um, and I've just been playing a lot of lot of Destiny too. But I do appreciate, talking. and this is for the audio listeners. I noticed that Nick's eyes keep darting over to a different screen for no particular reason, of course. What you looking at over there, Nick? Um, right now, as we are recording, the Overwatch League finals are happening. Oh my and, god! Um, and while I am properly committed to this, I, <laughs> I, I do feel obligated to keep an eye out because a i play overwatch a lot um my team that i support made it to the finals and there's like six seed out of like the 12 teams that are there and they're playing one of the um three all korean teams and as we know not to be stereotypical but south koreans generally are known to be good very oh, good. yeah no not even stereotype you know it's hard coded in um, it's, it's just it's, uh <laughs> <laughs> they're born with it right yeah, to the yeah. teens <laughs> wow okay uh yeah it's just weird because maybe it was just me. I was always told that, and this is a stereotype, I'm sure, that uh, Japanese players were typically worse at shooter games because they weren't used to it compared to other types of games. And I would have thought that would have extended over to the uh, the rest of uh, the Far East. So for some reason, it just throws, throws me off that a shooter game would uh, be their forte still. I know. So in terms of shooter games, I think like on average, you know, Japanese players don't play many shooter games compared to other genres. Uh, right. That's actually one of the reasons why Microsoft does so poorly in that region. Uh, mm-hmm. But also, of course, because of other reasons, because Microsoft's not a Japanese company and that's a big thing over there. But uh, another part of it, too, is more so that, yeah, no, just in general with uh, when it comes to other genre games, even fighting games, for example, there's generally considered to be, OK, there's the Western players of fighting games and then you can go fight the Japanese players who will blow you up no matter what. What, every single time, like it's yep. a different league. It's a different league. 
It's uh, uh, story time. Let, let the campfire uh, flare up a little bit, as Nick would request. There was a time when I had an Xbox 360 for about four to six months, and it was fun. I had Halo 3. I was really enjoying it. I was also during, uh, or I was. it was during the Weeaboo stage that I had, like super heavy. Oh, man, I, I cursed my heritage, and I wish I lived and was born in Japan kind of thing. And so I was like, I want to play a Japanese Wait, player. You still, you still don't curse your heritage and wish you live in Japan? Yeah, come on, man. I know, I know. Uh, That's weak. <laughs> I try to recover, man. <laughs> no recovery. That's weak. You go in deeper. <laughs> And so I Googled so many different ways of how to play with fellow Japanese Halo players. And <laughs> there is in fact a way. And so I had to change my entire system to the Japanese format. And there were two of them. It, it was a terrible idea. Understand how to navigate over to Halo 3 and somehow get into online for, you know, Slayer. And as Cam would suggest, there was quite a few, as in just a few. Yeah, there was like three or four that I was playing on Halo. <laughs> I'm like, what? This is it? Like, we had to get like a, like almost a custom match, and they were terrible. Oh yeah, and that I think that's what cemented my uh, concept that Japanese players aren't as good at shooters as other things because of my one experience of trying to weeaboo my way over to the Japanese servers of the Xbox 360. Which, uh, honestly, I think the Sahara Desert probably had more players on the uh, 360 than Japan. <laughs> and funny enough, funny enough, actually, considering you were playing in the 360, which sold the best in Japan among those three systems, like the Xbox One and the original and uh, then 360. So, like, that was the best selling in Japan. So that gives you an idea. That gives oh, you yeah. an idea. Oh, yeah. Yep. So, as the new tradition now dictates, we are going to be immediately going into the Pokemon Go Watch. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy Pokemon Go, congratulations, you are at the right place. And if not, welcome to the right place. You're going to be enjoying yourself so much time, or so much fun, so much time to have here. Don't worry, not too much time. Nick, give us your Pokemon Go minute. Um, nothing. I've not played much Pokemon Go. I haven't been out of my house much. I haven't been to any Pokestops. I haven't gotten any gifts. I haven't caught any Pokemon. I That's feel really scary. bad because I haven't like sent anything to anybody in a while. But yeah, I noticed uh, the, this almost feels like a cursed moment. But Cam's been me, giving me more gifts than you have. Like I'm starting to get worried. Like, do I have to call in and make sure that you're alive? Well, what mind you, house? just purely because I haven't been getting to school as much because we're in that phase now where it's just like kind of study at home, work on projects and then study for finals. So I haven't had really a reason to leave the house and I'm like stocked up like I do groceries once a week. So I don't have to really ever leave the house. Like I just cook or okay. like chuck a frozen pizza into the oven. So using Pokemon Go uh, gift giving and receiving shouldn't be my way of declaring whether or not your, your, your well-being is okay. No, just shoot me a message. I think that's probably the safest bet first. <laughs> okay, like I'm pretty low income when it comes to like, oh man, I hope next fine. And you should probably also give me about 24 hours to reply because I am horrible that way. I take forever to reply to anything. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty like so negative in that way that generally if somebody doesn't ask me a question specifically, I will just not respond. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> it sticks because there's been a lot of times where people ask me questions, yes or no, or say something, and they expect a reply, but instead I just nod at my phone. It's like, mm, yes, I agree. <laughs> it's like, then like eight hours, like, what do you think? I'm like, I, oh yeah, I was supposed to say something, wasn't I? I wasn't supposed to like telepathically send a message. Like, yeah, I, I, I yeah, sure, yeah, that's okay. Uh, Cam, you, what's been going on your end for the Pokemon Go world? Uh, not much. So I've had a lot of days off from contract work recently. So I've been, that's actually why I've been giving you more gifts is because I've been hitting more Pokestops and actually getting gifts. Ooh, so I've, I've had enough to pass them all around. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I just, you know, been going on runs pretty much and playing while I go hatching eggs faster, uh, things like that. Nothing particularly special. I haven't hit any raids recently. I just kind of, it's why I'm behind everybody in terms of level who played as much as I do, because I just play every day casually. I don't really go out much anymore and go hardcore on it. Okay. Okay. Uh, myself, uh, I have, uh, for the, the most of the news front, it's pretty mediocre information. I haven't gotten that much, caught a few Pokemon. I think the most notable thing would be the Alolan Raichu from the uh, three-star raid, which I was very excited for. In fact, that's my uh, wallpaper when I got the new phone, because, you know, I, I love Alolan Raichu. And uh, one of really my cool friends... Design. What's up? It was really cool design when they announced it. Oh, yeah. I, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. And then in game, Alone Raichu was actually like really quick. And I'm talking about like uh, Sun and Moon and Ultra Sun and Moon. Mm -hmm. Not, um, yeah. 
And uh, I have a friend who called me last night. He's like, hey, I know you haven't been able to go to the X raids. I got two Mewtwo's. Once we get best friend status, I want to trade one to you. And I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. That actually reminds me. I got a, my third EX raid pass. I did do that. So I did actually do one raid because I hit Registeel. I think that was last last weekend, though. Yeah, that was before last recording. But I got an EX raid pass off of that. So that's good, too. Uh, nice. I already have two Mewtwo, but that hopefully will be my third. Oh, ooh, I'm jealous, man. I really want a Mewtwo. I've been wanting a Mewtwo since uh, you know, I started the game. And uh, on the darker side, we have mentioned this topic before uh, about my phone carrier provider who whispered dark tales into my ears about yes. the uh, the evil side. I uh, I decided that I do not want to do that for my main account. I'm going to leave it alone because A, probably going to get banned almost immediately, and B, I really enjoyed the idea of uh, playing the Spark Clean Cut. However, for the sakes of craps and giggles, I uh, decided to pull out a random account and see how far down the rabbit hole I can go with this. And uh, that is GPS spoofing. And that is some crazy stuff. That is dark stuff, man. Like anybody who actually uses that to like progress the game is that that ruins it. Like it takes the uh, the joy out of everything because. <laughs> Like, uh, I guess, because I used to do the whole botting thing back, like, you know, when it first started, I'm not proud of it. And obviously those accounts are long gone, but I realized that I do enjoy the idea of walking. I feel appreciated when I complete a Pokemon gym or go to a raid and we all meet up and do stuff. And GPS spoofing, is, it just loses all that magic immediately. It turns it from a social commutative experience to like, oh, let me sit in this chair and move this little virtual thumbstick and catch ratataz and that's my joy and, and it then, becomes like why are you playing it at that point it becomes. exactly it's kind of like what you said on twitter what yeah why, yeah why am i playing the and so i don't think it's going to last for long for me because it's going to kill the game if i play it the, mm -hmm. you know leveling this character somewhere in the middle of uh somewhere in like northeast europe <laughs> Just some random place that uh, apparently has a lot of pokey stops, and I'm like, oh, I'll catch you a Pokemon. This is fun. I can never trade these because I feel like it's going to immediately get my account banned. So what's the point of doing this? And so that's uh, that's the Pokemon Go watch. Uh, probably five five minutes right there. <laughs> let's uh, let's put that one to rest. Nick, what have you been playing, buddy? Um, as I mentioned earlier, Destiny Two. Really? Destiny Two. Destiny Two. Is that Destiny. a new game? Does did that just come out? Brand new game. It's actually, I'm actually in the uh, closed beta. It's actually coming out September 4th and it's <gasps> launching not as Destiny 2, but as Destiny 2 Forsaken. Stop. Uh, <laughs> Does that come with uh, an expansion pack where we're supposed to forget every single thing that happened about Destiny up until that point? I've Does never heard of that game. Yet. This is just Destiny 2. It's a brand new game that's launching as Destiny 2 Forsaken. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Whatever okay. helps to so, sleep at night, so man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on my on my own little, like, little mini rant here about Destiny 2. Go for um, it. Destiny, Destiny 1. Rant minute. Destiny 1. Towards, towards the end of its life cycle, um, year 3, as we called it, uh, there was a lot of imbalances, be it with uh, weapons and uh, player abilities, class abilities, subclass abilities. Bungie just had a very poor, did a very poor job of balancing things and communicating things and just getting things deployed on time. To like for a game that has such a big uh, PvP player base, they were shipping out fixes and balances, you know, six months at a time. And you can't do that for a game that had like such a big concurrent player base. And so what happened with Destiny 2 is they wanted to reinvent everything, essentially. They kept right. the lore, the mystery of the lore, the way you do things to some extent uh, the same or they uh, made it better. Uh, the core gunplay, the, the way guns feel and how you move through the space is fantastic. They did a fantastic job with that. But when it came to player abilities, to weapon balancing, to what the weapon meta uh, settled to, they did a horrible job. So they had a weapon system where you'd have a primary weapon, like an assault rifle, a, a burst rifle, which we called pulse rifle, a scout rifle, a hand cannon, which was just a pistol, um, or a sidearm, which was like a smaller pistol, but didn't hit as hard and didn't have as much range. And then you'd have a secondary weapon, like a shotgun, a sniper rifle, and a few other things. And then you'd have a heavy weapon, um, which was a rocket launcher and a light machine gun. So in a PvP game, you'd have a uh, heavy ammo drop once or twice a map a match that everybody could collect and that you know activated a few minutes of frenzy but otherwise people had to rely on their primary and secondary weapons um and so this 
you know, we had a shotgun meta, we had a sniper meta, we had all sorts of like weapon combinations that were just fun to play and fun to do things around. Um, and then year three of Destiny One, that sort of um, you know uh, went all, went to hell because uh, some uh, what you call it character ability subclass abilities were being abused, some weapon types were being abused, and Bungie did a very poor job of balancing. Now when we come to Destiny Two, what Bungie did was they changed the weapon system. So now you had um, shotguns, rocket launchers, sniper rifles, all lumped into one um, uh, category, and they renamed into the heavy ammo category, basically. So I, I understand the logic because they wanted to force it uh, to come down to player skill and not to like the kinds of weapons they were using necessarily. Like for example, I know I can outshoot most other players with a with a pistol or with an assault rifle, but oh, the moment you they got have confidence there, don't you? To some extent, I have confidence. I'm not like a great player, but I know I can do quite well. But the moment they pick up uh, ammo for a rocket launcher, I lose. And when that happens so often, it gets frustrating. And on the PVE side, rocket launchers and sniper rifles should not be in the same category just because of the amount of DPS that they do. Mm. Right. Um, and so they made like a lot of questionable choices when it came to the weapon slot management, a lot of questionable choices with um, a lot of quality of life things that they uh, removed from the game. Destiny 1 had private matches. Destiny 2, they had to add private matches in. Really? Yeah. So it didn't come with the base game, which made no sense. Um, and a lot of it seems like Bungie were being forced to make decisions and forced to put out a game, probably because of Activision. I feel like the I next. more than likely. I wouldn't doubt that one bit. I can't. It's I can't. The publisher's fault. <laughs> I can't put all the blame on Bungie, uh, but I can't take a lot of it away from Bungie. They made a lot of questionable choices, and I feel like if we had more time, or if sorry, not if we, if they had more time, I would be okay with them taking two years between Destiny Two, Destiny One, and Destiny Two, and giving out like a game that we deserve. What Destiny mm-hmm. Forsaken is going to be. That's totally understandable, Nick. But mm-hmm. it's you can wait the stock and shareholders cannot wait and exactly. neither can yeah. the publisher so the problem is so while i understand that from the stocks the shareholders the publisher what a lot of gaming companies don't realize is whatever they do for the consumer in the long run will give them will have the better payout a lot of public a lot of gaming a lot of the gaming industry they're only worried about what will give them the best payout right now and which is fine but in the long run if you want to make a business last and if you want to make a game franchise last you need to think about the consumers mm. a delayed game is eventually good a bad game is bad forever exactly so destiny 2 forsaken uh they've there have been a bunch of um uh, patches and a bunch of things they've been changing because there was never any replayability to the game so they've added a bunch of that they've added a grind back to the game where you some people have like their weapons that you have to do from weekly missions uh, that are super hard and people have done it a hundred times and still not gotten the weapon. Right. So there's a reason to like there was never any reason to play the game. There, There is a level system in the game, a power level system that doesn't really matter in a lot of situations. So what's the point of getting to like the level cap? Um, and so they're starting to make that matter. Um, the game modes, PVP game modes in Destiny 1 used to be 6v6. Then they changed it to 4v4 which made no sense because all you can do out in the world as a PVE activities are either 3v3 or 6v6. There's nothing you can do 4v4. So if you have like, a, you know, four, four of you that play regularly, there's you can't do all the things with them at any time. Whereas in Destiny 1, it was me and two of my friends. We did everything regularly and we could do almost anything, just the three of us. So has Bungie uh, announced anything about this being changed in September? Have they put any mention that it's being worked on right now? Yeah, so there's a roadmap. So they've been a little, they've been a lot uh, better, yeah, actually. Ten-year roadmap. I, I missed that thing. Not even a ten-year roadmap. It's a constantly updated, like six-month, eight-month roadmap. Okay. And they're finally like communicating with us. Um, better late than never. Um, but it should have happened a long time ago. They did a player summit where they gathered YouTubers, uh, streamers, and other content creators who focus on Destiny in uh, April. Uh, they did it for two or three days where they showcase some of the new stuff that's coming out to them to get their feedback on it. And that should have also happened like years ago, not like now. Um, but again, better late than never. It's happening. Um, the biggest change, the biggest change that everybody's excited about, a couple of things. There's a uh, um, replayability coming back, reason to play the game, weapon slot changes, so it's going to go back, it's going to be a hybrid system of Destiny 1, Destiny 2, uh, the general reaction to it was quite uh, good, 
um, and they're moving their expansion system. So how their like their DLC used to work is you'd uh, pay for expansion one and expansion two separately or buy them together, and all that money was going to go into uh, creating new uh, story content and other things. More planets. They've changed their mind. They're like, whatever. Uh, so here's the ex- annual pass. You pay this much now. You can pay for each individual one. And they're going to go into creating more things to do. We're not going to focus on story anymore. Right now, we're going to focus on you and giving you a reason to play. Fair enough. And hopefully yeah. that works. Hopefully that works. Yes. Um, everybody's really excited. A lot of the things that's been coming out in the last few days, there have been a lot of Game Informer articles. I've not, I could have put them in the news section, but I didn't want to because I didn't want to spoil things for myself because they've been taking, uh, they've been looking too in depth into the game into Ooh. what's coming out and i and i want to keep some of that mystery for when i do jump into it on september 4th okay speaking yeah. of in depth i need to get the deepest darkest hottest take given to me by mr cam himself please i asked you before ladies oh, and gentlemen yeah. give me the burning fiery passion that is octopath traveler is right, what it do you fun? want oh it's okay. fun oh it's fun yeah uh, i'm gonna hit you like weird counterpoints of what i'm worried about as an rpg all right you let's ready? go yep. okay so Octopath Traveler looks great, but I'm not sure how I feel about playing a game that looks like it should be on the Nintendo. Huh. <laughs> Sorry, I need a little laugh there because no, it does not by any means look like it should be on the Nintendo. I'll tell you this, challenge, try and put this on anything short of uh, probably a PS3 or an Xbox 360. It won't happen because there's too much in terms of the effects. There's too much in terms of the you know visual after, effect, after effects, the bloom and stuff like that, uh, ambient inclusion, things like that to actually run on a system like the sprite itself or this is actually a fun thing so the sprite itself because of how shading works and how lighting works in the sprite it's actually a 3d model a lot of people are theorizing we're not 100 percent sure on this but because of the way that the light refracts off the characters um, as they turn around and like move in the world they might actually just be 3d models that appear to be sprites which is something that uh, people have worked Such on before a as well beautiful game it's incredibly yeah, it beautiful, it's well, beautiful. Played that you can't it's hard man because no no great. i will say you can't of course you can't put it on a super nintendo no way no way no how and the people who've said this game should be 12 or 20 dollars because this has been a take people put out they get people said it should be 20 dollars because it looks like you know it's a sprite based game just that's the worst possible take i've ever heard one of the worst i've ever heard because not only is this something people have to consider is that making sprite based games is not simple it's not like um we've talked about it before briefly but it's not some sort of simplicity thing that's like somehow leagues below making a 3d game like there are tools that assist you in either case to make it incredibly intuitive to do once you know the system of course once you know the program so it's not by any means less effort put into it god if we were talking about effort just in terms of the amount of content given in the game the amount of detail paid attention to in terms of the npcs how every npc because you can ask questions about their person so you can inquire as one of their abilities every NPC in the game basically has items that they have on them that you can purchase from them or steal from them um, a backstory as well as sometimes unlocking hidden things and that goes for every every single NPC that you can talk to wow yeah okay. no, in terms of content it's it's incredibly full I'm uh, I generally just work through story content in games and then kind of move on and it's a, it's a 70 hour game. I think the, the music's probably just crappy old 8 bit, right? No, no, it's beautiful. Um, so I'm actually very, very partial to vocal tracks. I think vocal tracks uh, are one of my favorite things in terms of game soundtracks to yeah, the point where five, huh? anything to the point where when I hear, I make a joke with my friends basically that if something's not a vocal track, it's honestly not worth my time. I don't actually mean it, but like I do it as a joke where it's like, oh, I don't hear any voices in there. Not great, huh? Because <laughs> here's the thing, right? We talk about it, and this is the joke I make, which is um, Devil May Cry 5, right? Had Devil Trigger that song in the trailer the vocal track and i'm like that made top of the charts in the uk that made top music charts i'm like you don't see other video game you know orchestral music making top charts because in the western world one of the ways of thinking is we don't want the music to overpower the game we want the game to be the primary experience and the music to just uh, uh like i should say enhance it but not be the primary focus whereas in japan they don't mind going absolutely nuts on the soundtrack wow and this is a case of that without vocal tracks where i appreciate it despite not being vocal tracks because a lot of the music is not your sort of typical jrpg fare the music does change a lot depending on where you are in the world of course we talk about town themes and all that but also in battle depending on what tier you're in in terms of chapters like what tier of the the world map rings you're in the music changes and some areas music is just uh 
interesting to the point where it's not you know standard orchestral fare as i've said some even reminds me of uh near automata soundtrack i know flames grace which is in the snowy territory mm-hmm. the music there reminds me a little bit of near soundtrack without the vocals it's nice. a really really you know mysterious sort of ethereal airy uh, quiet single note snow music and stuff like that uh but no soundtrack is you'll hear it to the point where sometimes you'll even want to wait in battles to get to the good part of the music where you're like oh i don't want to finish it too soon i want to hit that good part so in terms of soundtracks probably the most distinct i've played this year most distinct soundtrack i've seen playing games this year uh besides something else i've actually played this week as well but that's because that was like a primary focus of the game it's, but yeah. it's amazing to me how fast an ost can convince me whether or not i would like or dislike a game because music is everything to me when it comes mm-hmm. to video games mm-hmm. it's weird because the wife is opposite she could play a game muted and it just breaks my heart it's like why yeah. would you do that to yourself it's like because i'm probably gonna watch netflix while i play this and it's like you're ruining your experience. And- yeah, I'm actually so I, I I'm half joking when I say this, but sometimes in terms of like ranking what's important in games to me, it goes like gameplay, then soundtrack, second story, visuals, all that could just be down at the bottom. I don't care. I want game, good gameplay, and I want a soundtrack. That's Absolutely, really, really bunch of weebs. Yep. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean if I'm a, like nerd. a good explanation for that, uh, his reasoning right there would be Splatoon 2. Great gameplay mm-hmm. and great uh, music to it, but, you know, little story for the most part besides, you know, the single player, of course. Yeah, and the uh, lore. <laughs> I know, right? Random sidebar. Have you guys heard about uh, them talking about the new Devil May Cry? Uh, in, in regards of talking well, they, recently? They, I, I believe they announced it in E3, but there oh, were yeah. talks uh, coming up uh, where they wanted to implement a... Uh, a user requested feature where as uh, Dante gets better and better in a fight, the music gets more and more pumping to each level. Yeah. So that was a, they said they were actually putting it in the game. So yeah, it was something that I don't even know if users, maybe you read more into that. I didn't know if users requested it, but what they said was that what they're going to do is literally the vocal track will kick in. If you're styling, like if your combo's going and not being so sounds so I know. Awesome. I'm so down. That's like the hypest thing I can possibly think of, especially with devil trigger being like, uh, it just gets you into it. Like, it. Oh crap. Vocals. This is serious. Now I got to keep this up to S yeah. plus plus plus. One of the big memories, actually, of 2017 in gaming for me, one of the biggest memories I had was uh, playing Nier Automata, which, of course, won in the Game Awards that year, Best Soundtrack of the Year, with Uh. Persona 5 being likely right behind it. And what happened was there was a moment in time where you enter a village at some point. I don't want to spoil too much, but they play this rendition of a music track on the OST called Wretched Weaponry. And I remember that being one of the few times in games where I actually stopped and I was like, all right, hold on a sec. This is cool. Like, I just need to take the scene in right now. What's going on in the background? Are we talking about what like, uh, the Disney World looking place? No, this was um, in the robot. Different? It's in the robot village. I'll say that. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's in the robot village, a uh, certain part in the game when you're. Uh, it's actually path B or C, I think. So. Okay, because I. I played a little bit of it before I gave up uh, after the third time. And uh, the music can be both enjoyable and very unsettling at the same time. Uh, it goes off the tracks the wrong way real quick once you realize what's going on. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, you need see. The thing is, you need a cranium. You need a brain that's about like a thousand times the size of this room to understand near. You need a Rick and Morty brain in order <laughs> to understand and appreciate near automata. Exactly. You need to be a basically um, genius level to understand near automata. Uh, yeah, getting them back. Some, sorry. No, go ahead. I did watch some Nier Automata gameplay for the first time. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a game I'd always been interested in, but I didn't want to, like, see too much of it before, like, I played it yeah. kind of thing. But I did watch uh, some gameplay of it, and the soundtrack was amazing. And talking about soundtracks, and I know at this point I'm probably a shill. I'm probably being paid yeah. off by Bob, but the Destiny soundtrack? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember it at all, unfortunately. <laughs> That's I, fair, but I... There are some moments where it's just mind-boggling. The first soundtrack was actually made, uh, like the first, without any of the expansions. Um, like OG Destiny soundtrack yeah. was made in collaboration with Michael Salvatore and Paul McCartney, I think. Oh. And it was, a, it's a beautiful soundtrack. And it, so if anything you can take away from any of the Destiny games, it's the art and the sound are always on point. So I feel bad for those teams because everybody else is failing them. They right, put right, so much right. effort and love into the like these aspects of the games that that's the only kind of redeeming feature for about five minutes before the like gameplay is just like I can't do this anymore. It's just boring. Did Salvatore work on Halo? Do you know? Because I remember seeing that name a couple times alongside Marty O'Donnell. I feel I f- on the Halo soundtrack. 
I feel like I would agree with you. Okay, but we're not 100 percent sure on that one. But uh, yeah, I no. thought that, that might yeah, be because it has like even from the beginning, the moment you saw like the 2012 or 13 like E3 trailer for Destiny, mm-hmm. all you could feel like was Halo. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, so it makes sense. Like early game, there are plenty of. You were uh, absolutely right. Uh, he does work on the soundtracks for the Halo game series. Bada boom. Yeah. <laughs> which um, are great soundtracks so i don't oh, doubt they're it. amazing yeah. soundtracks yeah, too, yeah. It, because these are the uh, again these i think these are one of the few uh devs who realize or understand that uh, music can add and mm-hmm. not necessarily be like a background thing like they can be a big part of your experience exactly and it's just that anytime i open up um destiny on my xbox for whatever reason like destiny one or mm-hmm. like here even like the uh, uh opening music theme song it's just nostalgia, chills. It's it's amazing. Anyways. Yeah, it actually reminds me a lot of, uh, especially that point. I think it was in Halo Two where you're going through the the you know Covenant High Charity and they play like that Breaking Benjamin song out of nowhere. Do you mm-hmm. remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Stuff like that sticks with you though. That's what I, I'm always shilling vocal tracks because I'm like, you know what? You think back about game soundtracks. What do you remember? Like in terms of like the best trailers to ever exist, right? The best, uh, you know, people will be like, oh yes, yeah, Simple and Clean, Kingdom Hearts, Mad World for Gears of War. Like they're always vocal exactly. tracks. You yeah. Think about. yeah. So oh, I'm like, they're great. they're great. So sanctuary. <laughs> but anyway, so so what other questions you got about Octopath? Hit me so, more. Yes. Anyways, back on the tracks for Octopath. <laughs> <laughs> like this train fell sideways off a cliff, went through a couple of forests, came back up, landed back on the tracks. We are keep going. Uh, so it has good story. It has good graphics. It has good music. Uh, how, we didn't even talk about story, actually. So feel free. Okay. Oh, no, actually, no. I'm going to back up. I'm going to have. I'm going to say it's a safe bet that this has a decent story. It's unique. I'll say that much. So uh, what I will say, it's not eight people trying to save the world. No, and that's the best part. So that's actually really quick. I'm going to keep this to like a two minute tangent. But one thing I always kind of lament is RPGs are always save the world and always, you know, fight the evil god, save the world, right? The big bad empire. And what Octopath does is just like, nah, these eight stories are pretty self-contained. They're not major. They're stories you won't see in any other game because any other game with single protagonists has to focus on some big story. So in Octopath, you'll get something like, you know, yeah, no, this this apothecary over here, he just wants to travel the world and learn more about um, being an apothecary and try and be the best one he can. Uh, in another case, it might just be like, yeah, this one guy or this one girl is trying to find her master who went hunting a beast and never returned. And they're just simple, small stories like that, but I appreciate the uniqueness of having a story on that small scale. Okay. Yeah. Uh, battle mechanics. Is it going to be rough and tough for a newcomer back to the yeah. old uh, RPG style? Yeah, no, it's it's a difficult game. It's a difficult game. You can always, of course, since it's an RPG, you can always mitigate it with grinding. But uh, no, this game does require, especially past chapter two, uh, it definitely requires some know-how. You need to not. You can't brute your force your way through. You gotta understand what you're doing, uh, okay. which requires learning the systems. Ah, uh, but Cam, I don't want to play a game where I just grind in the same area over and over again. There's no grinding in this game. You don't have to. You just said that you'd have to grind. Oh no, I said you can mitigate it with grinding if you're a dummy. So that was what I was oh, saying there. Oh, oh. Which was which was basically what I said was. Are you trying to say that gamers are not the smartest people around? No, they are, and they should play more RPGs. Because my point is that basically you can get by totally fine without grinding and beat the game. I did, uh, but. If you want to mitigate how difficult the bosses are, you can grind, but that's a very unnecessary. What I more mean is when I think about grinding and requiring grinding, what I think that means is, okay, naturally through playing the game, you are not at a point where you can fight the boss. You need to go and grind specifically to go get levels so you can fight the boss. In Octopath case, it's like, okay, naturally playing the game, you're going to be on the level curve. You're going to need strategy to beat these bosses. If you don't want to do strategy, if you're like, I just want to hit buttons, then go grind for 30 hours and then fight the boss. But it's not fun that way. Uh, but you do not need to grind. And even less than needing to grind, uh, they've done so many things with this game to make it so the grinding is not a problem. So the team actually is very good at this because this is also the Bravely Default team. And what they did was they allowed options in game for speeding up the battle. So you oh, can yeah. speed up the battle four, four times in Bravely Default. You can alter how much like experience you get, how much BP you get, or job points you get in, in Bravely Default. So what they did in Octopath was interesting because they actually made it so that The level XP curve is so bizarre that if you're underleveled for an area and you go in and fight a couple guys and beat them, and they're hard if you're underleveled, they're very hard. But if you beat them, you'll pretty much level up to where you need to be immediately. But then once you're at that, like within that zone, you'll level up very slowly. 
So it's almost like the level curve is so exponential that like, for example, if I, if I have a team of level forties and I want to bring one character who's been sitting on the sidelines for a while, all the way up, it'll take no time at all. He'll be up to level like 42 in, you know, a few minutes pretty much. Wow. Uh, but once you're there, once you're at the level curve where the game wants you to be, everything will slow way down. So it's really interesting that if you need to grind, if somebody is truly under leveled, it can be done very quickly. But if things are where they should be, it's a slow process. So you actually have to go out of your way to do it that way. It keeps favorite, things challenging. Favorite four people on your team? Uh, so I've only worked through, I've actually done it in a group of four. So mm -hmm. I play through four and then I'm playing through the other four uh, because as I've said before, you can't take your first character you choose out of your team until you beat their story. Right. So I've beaten four of the character stories completely and I'm on like chapter nice. twos of the other four. But I'd say so far, uh, Hanit is the Huntress. She's the most versatile character in the point where uh, she has the most options basically available to her. If you're playing the game and want to do a challenge run of like just one character or just two, Han, it's necessary because she's so she's versatile. Got a though. <laughs> she's uh, she's got some buddies Thank you, and Fine <laughs> Han, it, Han, it's up there. Definitely. Tress is great. She's a merchant girl, a young merchant girl uh, who wants to sell stuff. Uh, so she's pretty good as well. Uh, let's see. In terms of usefulness, Alfin. Uh, because he's an apothecary, so he can hit like every weakness a couple times, and he has this crazy axe attack. It's actually a joke going around, around of him cocking a gun, but it's just an axe head, and it's like I'm a healer, but and it's like nine 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 damage over the screen oh, <laughs> because geez. he can just do some stupid damage with his axe. Um, as for a fourth, I'd probably say Cyrus. Uh, he's the scholar. I'm just starting to use him, but Cyrus's whole thing is something I really appreciate, which is he's too he cares too much about being a scholar that he's oblivious to girls and stuff. And he's just kind of like, like, I don't care. Like some girls are trying to like, you know, like understand, like understand we love you. And he's like, I got to go find some books like and just goes off. He's great. No, he's great. On your show over on in the video games, weren't you comparing him to Gumbario and Gumbrella from the Paper Mario series? Uh, I don't think so. That might have been a different show because uh, we didn't. Yeah, we didn't talk about Cyrus too in depth on uh, into the video game yet. Okay, because apparently there's a character that he will tell you about everything, any little. Yeah, detail. yeah. Is well, that Cyrus or is that somebody else? So that's Cyrus and Alfin because their path action is scrutinize and also inquire, which is basically that's what I was talking about with the NPCs. They'll basically ask an NPC a question, and you'll learn all about that NPC, what their life has been like, how old they are, their life how, story, their no, World of Warcraft lore page. Mm -hmm. It's straight their life story. It'll be like this NPC grew up in blank and you know lost her husband ten years ago, and she's been carrying her his harpoon ever since, or something like that. And of course, you'll find his harpoon on her. Uh, things like that. So yes, because it's kind of that like enemy scrutinized kind of thing that Goombella and Goombario do do in Paper Mario, where it's like learn the weakness, learn the HP uh, and stuff like that. But Cyrus is that definitely in terms of function. Okay. Yeah. Is How, how far are you into this game right now? Uh, 40 hours. Oh, yep. last time we talked, it was 22. Yep. Ooh. Ooh. It's an RPG. So when I, when I get my RPGs, when they come to my desk and my fangs are bared, they go in. We oh, go in so, until we're done. So it's, it's not a good game then, otherwise. No, it's general. absolutely no. terrible. Absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible game would never play 10 out of 10. Yeah, <laughs> if you've never played an RPG before, though, probably not a good one to start on, I think. Right. Uh, it's definitely it's accessible in that you definitely aren't constrained to a single plot. So you can do whatever you want. But for some people starting an RPG, they want a story a lot like they want a, like a hardcore story. Yeah, I'll put it this way. Like, I think that people, when they start start getting into RPGs, want to save the world a few times. You know what I mean? They want to be on that big shonen journey a few times before they do this more unique stuff that's a little more in depth. But yeah, no, it's wonderful. Like, oh, I'm just you're doing eight different tales of uh, you know, middle, you know, maybe some high causes and passage of rights, I guess. But save the world is just like the top big thing. Yeah, no, some of them are really funny because like right now my team is like a, three people who are kind of just in it for semi selfish reasons or exploratory reasons. So like Tressa's like, eh, I want to go sell some stuff. You know, uh, Alfin earlier was like, I just want to travel the world, get some potions. A uh, theory on the thief is like, I got to steal some stones because of my pride. I got to I got to do that. And then Primrose is there as my fourth character, just kind of chilling. And she's like, yeah, so uh, my dad was killed by three dudes when I was a child and I've had to grow up in a whorehouse ever since and I need to vengeance and it's just like oh oh <laughs> like compared to everyone else just standing around like 
Huh. That, that's like T7 of Naruto. Like, yeah. I'm Naruto. I like to make clothes. Oh, man, I got the hot for this, uh, this, you know, this dark, cool looking kid. And then it's Sasuke like, Sasuke is just like, I need to kill my brother. My, my brother killed my entire family. It's exactly I like I need that. to kill him. Yeah. Uh, oh, gosh. Uh, one funny thing I found, though, is there is some story disconnect because of that, where the game has to treat each character like they're alone in their stories. So there'll be some scenarios, for example, where like I was playing as the cleric who's like, uh, you know, lady of the church um, sister. Right. And yeah. like two two uh, random civilian like villagers knocked her out at one point to like put her in jail. And I was just kind of like, OK, so, yeah. She was there, but so was the big burly nightman, the huge dude with an axe, and the huntress. Like, you're not going to knock them out. Like, you know what I mean? So it does get disconnected a couple times because it assumes in the stories that everybody are alone. Um, but also simultaneously that they're together. It's weird. It's weird. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, yep. Has there been any other games on the table that you could play besides Octopath? Yeah, I played Fury, which was a Steam game I was requested to play, actually, by a listener of Into the Video Game. Oh. So, yeah, Fury is a... Okay, ready for this. This is a stylish action bullet hell... Oh, boy, there's a couple more. Hold on. Stylish action bullet hell, shoot em up but also um, boss rush. Yeah, there's a lot red going flag, on. Red flag, red flag, red flag. There's a lot going on with Fury. So the idea is basically, okay... There's 10 bosses in Fury. You have to go through the soundtrack is synth wave stuff and, you know, synth like outrun type music, like eight neo 80s outrun type music. So it's all like heavy beats like dun 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 And uh, basically what you got to do is, you know, fight the 10 bosses. The action is you have like one combo button basically, but everything is moved so incredibly quick. It's all about parrying. It's all about dodging. Uh, you have basically teleport to dodge. When you parry, you recover health. And uh, there's some crazy mechanics in that where... Once you get a boss down to a certain level of health, basically, you enter a close combat mode. And if you lose that fight, the enemy will gain back all their health and you'll lose a full bar. But if you win, you gain back all your health and they lose a full bar. And each enemy has like six stages, but also different patterns of attack between all the stages. And some of them are just bullet hell. So bullets just, you know, shots will just fly out everywhere. You got to dodge them. It's a very difficult game. It's meant to be an incredibly difficult uh, game. I'm playing it at the normal difficulty and I'm, I'm doing it. I'm making it happen. I'm about halfway through right now. But uh, yeah, it was pretty wild. It's definitely worth the seven bucks I paid for it. Okay. Uh, I, I see Space Harrier. Yeah, Space Harrier. So oh, I played that on is this stream. your Friday game? No, this was uh, played on stream actually yesterday. So this was for the Sega your Master. Friday game? Yeah, sorry. I thought you said fighting game. Oh, okay. I, I was like, <laughs> no, nah, not fighting game. Uh, yeah. the, not the days. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah, this was my Friday game. So Space Harrier, it's for the Sega Master System, came out in 85. It's actually made by Yu Suzuki uh, over at Sega AM2, which was one of their major development divisions. Yu Suzuki also made Shenmue, the very famous series, and uh, many other things like Outrun, Afterburner, uh, Hang On, things like that. So he's a big name. I feel like I've seen Space Harrier played before, and I don't in remember it being a very enjoyable experience. It's, you know, here's the thing, right? It's a, it was an arcade game originally. So porting it to the master system, Did there was have a lot of things. Fields, like separating you from different areas? No, no. Okay. So Maybe they, I'm mixing it up with just Harrier. I don't remember. Maybe even, I haven't tried Space Harrier 2. There is a sequel. So I'll have to check that out. That's on Genesis, I think. But you basically are running into the background. And for an 8-bit game, it's actually pretty impressive in terms of what they managed to do. It's like a proto mode 7 almost, where it appears to be 3D where you're kind of running into the into the scene and everything's you know scaling pixel wise and coming at you the sprites are getting bigger to show they're coming closer to you mm. and it's uh one of the first like successful rail shooter uh, games actually out there so okay yeah uh how far have you gotten into it so far so we generally we play with those games you know they're very quick shoot them up especially very quick we abuse save states i just kind of want to play it so i got 14 out of 18 of the levels done and then our we accidentally saved over a death so I just kind of started over and played it. Ah, uh, that's right. I was mm -hmm. I was there. Oh man, that's yeah. Great. Wasn't that when you had your uh, your friend, your roommate over? That was the week before. That was for okay. Wonder Boy Three: The Dragon's Trap, another Master System game. That I believe a similar thing happened where yeah. you tragic man. Tragic. It happens a lot, but yeah, that's what I played. Nick, I just want to bug you a little bit over here. You mentioned something about playing a certain Pokemon Quest game on the phone. Did that ever come to the fruition or no? No, I, I, I got about five minutes in and I got bored instantly. Good. Thank God. Yeah. Good. Just run. Just run. I'm about yeah. to uninstall it, actually. 
any luck with uh, Bayonetta, actually? So I, I not, know you were not yet. Here. I wanted to, but Destiny Two, man. Like, I wanted to play that, and I think I don't know when I'm gonna get to Bayonetta actually because play we even Bayonetta. got Monster Hunter World coming out on August 9th, Fair. and as soon as my finals are done, that's all I'm gonna be playing until Destiny Two Forsaken comes out. I'm down. I mean, I'm down for you playing that. I'm not that <laughs> because I already played Monster Hunter World. For That's fair. Yeah, I've seen you. I've seen you play Monster Hunter World. <laughs> Myself, I played uh, a little bit of Bayonetta too. Long story short, I stared like I had a drink in my hand, staring at my Switch eShop screen with Octopath Traveler sitting there. Like, do I want to get this game? And I keep telling myself, yes, yes, please. And then I was like, there's got to be a better. Op-. I was like, wait, there's still the three-hour demo I could play. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, give it a shot. Just tell me, you know, if I like it, I like it. Yep. But then uh, it was going to take a little bit. So I was like, I'll pop a game in while I you know, wait for it to download, which I never actually got to it because things happened. So, and that was Bayonetta 2. And wow, that game is, it is something. Ding. <laughs> it, it's weird because everybody. Okay. I just realized every single time I get into a game I don't like, I get into weird high pitches and start bouncing up and down. I'm going to go straight to the point. That's because you're worried about me throttling you over this. Oh, why? Because it came out for a mythical console exclusively? I must defend it. <laughs> Fair enough. What, what Bayon- console? What What are we talking about? Oh, God. Look. Oh, you know. The- <laughs> you all can understand what console this came on. <laughs> Bayonetta 2 is a huge improvement on Bayonetta. That is uh, something I can say without reservation it's true the problem is though it feels like i'm hardly playing so much as pushing a single button maybe alternating buttons every now and then and i see this uh very pretty lady bouncing around and murdering stuff and then you know yo so close too slow and you know slowing down time and then turning into a bullet hell and then occasionally and it's very interesting because this is every single time i see a cutscene, i got to take a shot of something because i know something weird is about to happen i see a cutscene that involves very corny witty lines between two characters often with uh oh my gosh what is i guess her yeah her name is bayonetta but i know her for her uh her actual name yeah oh god what is that i'm i'm, I'm trying to remember what it's um like celine or something like that oh god yeah because it's what her friend calls her mm, it's been a while i played it when it came out for the wii u so i'm trying to remember that's the last so, time i played it i don't know how far i'm in technically i just entered uh past the gates of hell mm-hmm. and the 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 action is fun and <laughs> admittedly uh this is ironic even further because the wife was watching this. she's like i really don't like this game one bit but there's one thing i appreciate about it it's the music i'm like really I mean, she's like yeah i like the the uh the artistic style of the music there's got actual vocals to it which you know that's right up uh cam's uh area right there and uh it's a it's a fun hack and slash yeah, there's, there's no slashing and uh, I think I hit the 20 hour mark of my current Terraria run. So I'm having fun with that a little bit. Uh, got into the hard world with her. I'm I'm building very creatively because usually I just do very minimalistic, do whatever you can. But rather than shoot ahead of uh, Amanda each and every time that she goes to work or whatnot, I've instead started building creatively and I'm starting to make cool things like uh, a warp room and a room where I show off all my old armor sets and all that stuff. And it looks cool. I just wish she was doing something like that too, instead of rushing ahead, because then I got to catch up to her. But then I, you know, I'm putting so much darn time into this; it's crazy. But yeah, that's pretty much it right there. Terraria, Bayonetta two, and Pokemon Go. Sweet. So, okay, are we ready for the next fun section of this podcast? Oh boy, I can tell you, I'm a little bit ready. I, are Nick, you? I don't know yeah. how much I can help you this week. Metroid is a weak point of mine. That's okay. It's okay because I know for a fact that Nick studied. The Wikipedia for Metroid vigorously. Well, vigorously is a strong word. <laughs> uh, it's a, you know, I mean, I guess it is. It's what, three, four syllables? It's a strong 25 cent word. Is, yeah. is that uh, just an American thing, Cam? Uh, where you you say, like, oh, uh, that's a nickel word and that's a dime word. Oh, that's a quarter word. I've, I've never, never heard, heard that. that ever. <laughs> okay, so this is random, but it stuck with me, and other people have actually uh, coincided with saying this with me. Huh. Uh, if if it's a common word, you'd call it a penny or a nickel word, and then if it's uncommonly used, it's a dime word, but a word like splendiferous or whatnot is a quarter word. So when it vigorously came to me as a quarter word, but 
is, is okay. Maybe, so maybe that's up in your I area. I, I don't get it what here. I understand what you're trying to get at, but I've never heard that. Yeah, before. me neither. Okay. Well, yeah. oh, that, that that's awkward. No American <laughs> backup on this one, friend. <laughs> so I'm terrified now. Uh, if Nick is, I, I would say open season. I would say Cam, help him as best as you can. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna be my best. I'm gonna but. say this. This looks like it's gonna be a rough one because this is a this is a weak spot even on my field. Like okay. I I made sure to use the things in, uh, that I knew personally, and I was I had to be careful because. Uh, there was a couple of them where I wanted to get deep in the rabbit hole again. I was like, no, bad, Tyler. Bad, bad. <laughs> but don't worry. I got five questions lined up for you about Metroid, and you're going to be fine. You, you can do this. I got 20 bucks okay. ready for you over in that wine bottle. It's just in there. I just got to push it in. We'll push you at 60 bucks. You ready for this? I'm ready. Let's go. All right, Cam, Nick, let's do the Metroid quiz for the Nick Switch Initiative. <laughs> Nick, you got two this week, so yeah. make them count. I'll let you know if I know something. Okay, so question number one. What is the main villain of the first Metroid game? Is it A, Kraid, B, Ridley, C, Mother Brain, or D, Metroid? I do. Uh, I, I think I know this one if you want help. So um, I'm going to go with C, Mother Brain. Okay, is that your final answer? That is my final answer. Are you sure? Yes, I am sure. Okay, you are correct. It is, in fact, C, Mother Brain. Now, was that what you were thinking too, Nick? Or, or sorry, Cam? Cam? Yeah, Cam? because I mean, I actually played it for stream uh, recently. Okay. And I was like, okay, well, you fight Metroids, and Mother Brain's the big brain at the yeah, end. So. Yeah, and you didn't right. fight Ridley, and you didn't fight Great. so. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Or, well, you see, okay. Anyway. <laughs> I was hoping he was either going to pick Ridley or Metroid. That was my trick ones. Great is, you know, he's there, but he's not as yeah. known as Ridley, so. Yeah. All right. Question number two does not have a multiple choice. Going from Japan's Famicom to America's and Europe's NES, Metroid made a significant change to the saving system. What was it? Um, you could have up to three saves. Is that your per, final answer? That is my final answer. You can have up to three saves. Uh, three different characters, basically. That, well, as well, far well, as I can tell from the Wikipedia, is incorrect. Ooh. In the uh, America and Europe uh, NES version of Metroid, Instead of using a saving system, they had a password system. Oh, I was thinking. Does that, that, that sound right, Cam? Yeah. So there was a password system in Metroid One for NES. Yes. Okay. okay I'm getting cocky. So this is good. It's it's Ooh. it's it's. Uh, yeah. yeah. Give it challenge. Challenge. One, one, one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Question number three. This is multiple mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. What video game console did a Metroid game not appear on? Is it A, the Super Nintendo, B, the Nintendo 64, C, the Nintendo DS, or D, the Nintendo Wii? Oh, I have an answer for this. If you need help. I do too, but I can't do too much for yeah. you. Nick, if you need help for this one, I know this. I mean, I'll give you the answer afterwards if it makes it feel better. Okay, I'm going to pull you in, Cam. I want right. to say it's the Nintendo 64. And I would agree with you. Because yeah, so I'll tell you this right 64. now, Super Metroid's on the SNES, uh, Metroid Prime Hunters is on the DS, and other M's on the Wii, as well as the Trilogy. I was going to say, Metroid Prime 2, or Metroid Prime 3 Corruption, as oh, yeah, well as the, the entire yeah. Trilogy is on the Wii, so if your poll for the game from the Nintendo Wii is other M, I'm going to be kind of upset with you, because that was a crap hole game to memorize the Wii. Anyways, yes, D is out, so what is your final answer? Uh, B, Nintendo 64. And you are correct. Good job. It is, in fact, not on the Nintendo 64. <laughs> they had uh, expected to do something for the Nintendo 64, yeah. but things had fallen through, and eventually they had to push it off, and mm -hmm. Metroid Prime was the next focus afterwards. There's even a rumored demo, or there's a rumored version of it, kind of like there's the rumored versions of uh, Earthbound 64. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there is a somewhere, like, oh, the rumor of the Metroid build. Yeah, 64. Metroid 64. Yeah. Anyway. All right, question number four. And this one's going to be a tough one, but in fact, I did warn you about this beforehand, Nick, so hopefully you read this on Discord. Within two million, and according to Wikipedia, how many copies of the Metroid series game has been sold? Um, so i just like to say that I did, in fact, read uh, your message in Discord. Uh, okay. You did, indeed, to all the listeners, he did indeed did you, warn me. Did you do Control-F uh, numbers? <laughs> I, know, I know the answer if you want help, so. 
I did not do control F numbers, I just read the Wikipedia page because there are often times where I'll find start up looking at like video game articles and eventually end up on the topic of lobsters. So my answer would be 17.44 million. Holy <laughs> smokes, down to the wire. Ladies and gentlemen, that was his third win right there. That 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 takes it. Good job, man. Good job. But since you want to do a victory lap, you want to show off one last time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm gonna give you the last question just for funsies. Okay. Question number five. At Metroid Prime 3, there is evidence that another game was in the works but never came out. What is the name of this potential game? Is it A, Metroid Dread, B, Nightmare Metroid, C, Metroid Prime 3 Other Realm, or D, Metroid Samus Returns? Oh boy. Um, since it's Victory Lap, let me help. Uh, okay. Samus Returns is the name of the 3DS remake of the second game that was for Game Boy, so that's out. Uh, Metroid Dread is a thing because Metroid Dread was the theoretical name of Metroid Prime. One of the theoretical names they're throwing around of Metroid Prime 4, and that might have been, if I remember right, in relation to that, it has been something that showed up before. So it could be Dread. It could be Dread. Uh, I never heard about the others, but I've heard about Dread before. I've also heard Resurgence for the newer one, but Dread is probably my pick based on I've heard that before. My favorite one is Metroid Prime Revengeance. Uh, <laughs> she plays as with the sword. Rising Revengeance. Oh, that's a good game. I love that game so <laughs> Metroid much. Metroid Prime Rising Revengeance. Oh, I love that game. But <laughs> yeah, I'm I gonna love- I'm gonna trust Kemp. I'm gonna say uh, Metroid Dread. Yes, uh, you are correct. Uh, it was in fact a Metroid Dread. It was lightly mentioned in a, a little uh, not video file, a textbook uh, textbook file. There we go. Mm. Uh, Metroid, sorry, Samus would scan one of the things that was talking about how in this random area far off, they were doing a large farming of Metroids that was going off uh, the scales called Project uh, Dread. And people were, it said, progress was going well, should be uh, coming to full fruition soon. Uh-huh. And people t- took that to thinking, oh gosh, Metroid Dread is a game. It should be you know being developed soon. And in fact, uh, it was apparently in progress at some point, but it got shut down fairly quickly, and it's been barely talked about ever since. Yep. It's been a theoretical name for the new one coming out, so we'll see. But yeah. All right. Yeah. So that's what uh, that's what the quiz did. Now, that was four questions, I thought. Did we do four five? Because he got, he got, he got three I, I, in a row, and then... Oh, he screwed up on the second one for the oh, uh, password yeah. system. I made a mistake. Oh, that's right. Sorry, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was five. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yep, so that did it, which means... Let me double check my... <laughs> Five numbers, geez. Which means yeah. next week's me, and what are we doing? Ooh, who, who should pick this time? Mm, well, I'll make it because we talked about switching off. But right, what right. do you want to do? What are you going to do? Well, Nick got the pick last time, and he kind of put himself in a nasty spot, but he still pulled through. So I'll give him full credit for that. Cam, I feel like if you're going to make it, I did make and choose the first time myself. How about you pick it and you get to set the score? Okay. How about this? We're going to be dealing with Nintendo lore. No game series, just Nintendo. Wait, you're going to you're gonna make him go Wikipedia Nintendo? Yeah, we're going to talk about, what's it called? We're going to talk about Nintendo consoles. We're going to talk about, ooh, it's going to okay. be a good time. Okay. I'm, d- I'm <laughs> down with that. That's going to be, that. okay, I'm in the... I won't argue with that. I'm pushing and, my fire. <laughs> oh, man, I, I feel bad now because uh, we just did part one of the history of Nintendo. So you'd be all set up to 1960, but yep. that's still like 20 something years before the Nintendo Entertainment System came out. So uh, yep. listening to that probably wouldn't help you too much, but it'd give you a, a very good perspective about the Wikipedia article. I will say, just go ahead and look at the Nintendo Wikipedia article. We'll keep it to the Nintendo Wikipedia article, and I'll just pull from there. But I will tell you right now, it's going to be about consoles and potentially numbers. Um, potentially some numbers, not too many. Probably two to two out of five will be numbers. We'll say, but it'll be about consoles, and it might be about people involved as well. So we'll talk about people and consoles. And that's what we'll do next week. Nintendo related on the Wikipedia page. Okay, challenge accepted. All right. So, random bit of history for you. Uh, there is a character called uh, Gunpei Yokoi. Yeah, Gunpei uh, Yokoi, the creator of or designer of many different of the consoles. Most famous Nintendo designer. He uh, started off as a engineer for Nintendo, uh, maintenancing uh, conveyor belts and whatnot, and that was his thing. And then uh, he 
was working on something like an extendo grip, essentially, kind of like the cartoon. You, you twist the handle and a giant cartoon uh, fist comes punching out. Mm-hmm. But instead, it could grab things. And Hiroshi Yamauchi uh, really loved it. And so he is like, hey, turn this into a toy. And they turn it into a toy. They sold a ton of it. And then uh, Gunpei Yokoi started working you know, further and further on, on the toy field. And eventually, he started becoming, later on, the executive uh, producers of many of the Nintendo games. Uh, the one that threw me off was, in fact, Metroid. He was an executive producer of Metroid. Mm-hmm. And he also, like as I mentioned, he was the main designer for a lot of the consoles in terms of their aesthetics. So he would say, like, oh, they'd go over and, and as you said, like Hiroshi Yamuchi and uh, Iwata and uh, Miyamoto in some cases would, you know, they'd, they'd have an idea. They'd storm, you know, brainstorm something. And uh, whoever or whenever they decide to make a new console, they'd always consult Gunpei Yokoi. And I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, he designed the original Game Boy, the Virtual Boy, the Game Boy Advance and the DS, I think. And even as far as... Some of the main home consoles as well. A lot of handhelds, though, if I remember right. I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing how many people like rise and start them really quickly off of like the most base routes. Like mm-hmm. Shigeru Miyamoto, uh, he was originally just an artist for Nintendo. And the only reason why he got an interview with Yamauchi was because apparently his parents knew Yamauchi pretty well. But Yamauchi uh, was not ready just to hand it to him. He's like, you got to convince me. Yeah, and uh, well, obviously you did a good job because he's here. Yeah, remember those names, Nick, because they're going to come up next week. I'd say the four biggins you're going to want to remember. Going to be on the test is remember Hiroshi Yamuchi, remember Satoru Iwata, remember Gunpei Yokoi, and remember Miyamoto. Okay, Jigeru Miyamoto for full name. Spark so. notes right there, baby. Yeah, those are going to be important names. So, and maybe uh, maybe we'll get Western. So maybe Reggie Fisame and maybe Bill Trinan. Remember those as well. So. Oh man, uh, throat's starting to catch up on me. Yeah, let's uh, let's burn into the news. Uh, get this out of the way real quick. Uh, first article is about World of Warcraft. Oh, yeah, that's a game. Yeah, it's a it's a real popular game actually. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it was announced last week that instead of making people pay twenty bucks to buy every expansion up until Legion, and then pay for Legion, and then pay uh, fifteen bucks a month, they said screw it. Uh, everything up to uh, and including legion is now completely free and uh you just got to pay the 15 bucks a month now and cool. you, you know 15 bucks a month you can access every single expansion right now all the way up to battle of uh for azeroth which okay. uh, is coming out later this year august which 14th it, i believe somewhere around that time yeah it's and that is a huge thing mm-hmm. the idea that you can just drop 15 bucks to get what would have cost you between be anywhere between 20 and like 120 dollars because like back in the day you know the closest thing you got was the battle chest which included wrath of the lich king and burning crusades but then you had to buy cataclysm then you had to buy mr pandaria and then you had to buy warlords of draenor and it just kept going on and on every single one would be like 10 20 bucks you'd be lucky if you could find a cheaper alternative but well, they, i mean um, looking at it from my perspective i was thinking of getting to world of, or at least trying out world of warcraft recently yes. and then i was thinking no, so no, we're not gonna go through this whole whole thing again. But I was, just down with my, I was sitting down with my roommate because he plays and he used to be a big uh, wow well, uh, person. But um, I sat down and I'm like, okay, I could try the seven day free trial. But let's think of what ifs. What if I really like it and what if I want to get into it? All right, I'll buy the base game. All right, now I really like. I'm done with the base game content. Now let me buy. I think it was Burning Crusades that was next. All right, I'm mm-hmm. done with Burning Crusades. Let me buy Rats of the Lich King next, and then it'll keep going on and on until I'm out of money and I can't afford anything else. So that was the one big put off for me to even think about even doing the free trial because I mean, if I really liked it, um, you know, I would have to pay all this money. But now that it's Oops. now that they made it free and just a subscription, like the monthly thing, it's good for getting uh, new people into the game, and also gets maybe like players who played up to you know uh, Warlords of Draenor and never got back into it. All right, well now I can do everything else free up to current content, and then see how it you know make up my mind about the game again. And it it was a great thing, and I applaud them for it. They realized yeah. that subscription money. The numbers are much higher than the cost of you know making people pay money to buy old expansions essentially and you know they saw through that and they need to get the numbers up so that's one easy way to help get people back into the idea of like hey maybe i should give, give this game a shot before uh battle for azeroth comes yeah. back into the play pool 
that's one thing I actually wanted to comment on is uh, we have to be you know honest with ourselves and say that MMOs aren't in their heyday anymore. Uh, they're oh, getting no. players in most cases while still having a ton of players, but there's only maybe you know three or four big viable MMOs at this point in time with World of Warcraft, Final Fantasy XIV, and a couple other things, Black Desert Online, and RuneScape, like that, RuneScape um, that are Guild Wars 2. and so yeah, Guild Wars Two, and so when you you have that subscription option and uh, you have to buy on top of that, it becomes of course a barrier to entry and so with games that are required and kind of built around having a big community it, when you're bleeding players like this you have to it's almost out of necessity i feel they did this where it's like okay we need to get people staying and we need to have people coming in too so yeah heck final fantasy 14 for the playstation 4 the client for that that should have stopped me from playing entirely in, in fact uh i think it was only because i knew it was a pain in the butt to try to get a refund from uh through the psn that i didn't do it but that was vicious, you know, 20, 30 gigabytes to download for the client. And then I had to create an account, which gave me so much trouble. Like I'm talking like three hours worth of trouble. And then once I cleared through that, the client had to download the actual like rest of the game, which was another 30 gigabytes that it had to do through its own client versus oh, through PSN. Geez. And so it had even more restrictions. And I'm sure you guys know this. The PS4 does have some issues occasionally with bandwidth. Uh, sometimes it does okay. Sometimes it drops like crazy and you got to put it into rest mode or reset it in some way. <laughs> At least it's not the Xbox One. <laughs> and that would be fine. But the problem was the Final Fantasy 14 client installer did not work in rest mode like the PSN would. And so I had to keep it on and pray to the, the bandwidth gods that it would work. And this took about three days to download and install properly. That's how bad it was. It was yeah. vicious. Like when it came on, it was like, this is going to take 16 hours. I'm like, I guess I'm going to be playing, you know, Ultra Sun for a little while. This is going to be, a, or not Ultra Sun, just regular. Uh, I was playing Moon, actually, because uh, Moon's much better. Sorry, Amanda. Anyways, back over to World of Warcraft. The, that wasn't even the actual topic. The, the real topic was World of Warcraft had uh, recently done some changes to the way that I uh, levels and health and all that has uh, been readjusted because before and I was talking with uh, somebody about this very specifically you could have 2 million health at the you know the max level it's probably more than that that's just DPS and it got dropped down to 20,000 2 million to 20,000 that's how crazy exponentially these stats have been adjusted uh, we haven't seen numbers like that since Burning Crusade and Wrath of the Lich King days and they have adjusted the enemy health as that as well. The problem is, so going from two million to in the thousands, that is such a crazy percentage to adjust to anything that it's been giving people some heavy troubles from level one to like level 110. Uh, just the the grind because suddenly monsters that you're able to, you know, let's say at level 30, you could burn through Strangle Thorn Valley all day and half the morning, no problem. Suddenly these guys are actually fighting back because their strength checks were only in the hundreds, but they they got adjusted weirdly to where they're actually fighting tough. Oh, okay. They're difficult again, and since you don't have as much health as you thought you did before, things are giving you a lot more trouble and with that suddenly people are struggling to do questing and whatnot uh the friend in particular was telling me that he his favorite thing to do nowadays is going to old expansions tearing through raids and getting cool transmog or you know cosmetic gear essentially the problem is though uh he would go through a level 60 40 man raid that he could blow away by himself suddenly it's given him difficulty for the first time in like six seven years jeez and it's like that i mean i think that's great honestly personally but apparently if you're by yourself and you're just trying to level up through the old quest you're having a crazy amount of time and uh right now uh it looks like blizzard is actually had put a second stat or sorry no they put a set uh squish sometime near cataclysm which made things uh really really weird but uh, they've been throwing hot fixes every single day just to uh, try to fix this and make it right so somebody doesn't get instantly murdered by a monster their level. Yeah, yeah. The problem with um, old systems like like this, it's I'm 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 a hundred percent sure the dev team is afraid to make any big changes because the code is so old and the underlying systems are so old that any sort of like drastic change could either break everything or change everything. Like as it is happening right now, 
you know, there could be cases where the peop- the person who made the original code is no longer working and coming from like a coding industry or coding background, if you don't comment out sections of your code or like leave little comments here and there telling people what does what, um, it causes a lot of problem going forward when they want to uh, migrate that to a new system or recreate it. So uh, that could possibly be one of the things they made a small change or they made a big change and that's just, you know, caused a huge wave. Uh, to change like a whole bunch of things. No kidding. 2018, they were working on the coding between 2000 and 2004. Like it came out in 2004. So we're talking 14 year old coding that's been alive and active and probably edited a crap ton. That's scary. It's, I mean, I understand the reason that they want to have it open to even toasters so anybody and everybody could play, even from, you know, Windows XP at this point. Yeah. But. Whew. I mean, if you want to talk about toaster play, just here's a fun little fact. Uh, Ultima Online still running. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. From like, yeah, 98, if not earlier, if I'm trying to remember exactly when that came out originally. But yeah. Heck, even RuneScape uh, updated its entire system. And I know, Cam, I understand. I respect your decision <laughs> saying that it's, it's it's bad, but it's a heck of a jump compared to their old school. It's, it's up there. Uh... Pokemon Go? More Pokemon Go news? Anybody want to take the bait for this one? Um, yeah, I was just reading through this, um, and I actually had no idea until I saw this article. I would pick um, on so- Cam, but Cam is currently frozen in time. <laughs> right, I'm frozen in time again? Okay, let's, so I'll okay. take the lead on this. Well, let's talk about numbers. Sales numbers for Pokemon Go is ridiculous. Pokemon Go sales numbers are in the millions. Like, the, the big sales numbers right here. And he's back. Anyways, Pokemon Go... Uh, Cam was right. He oh, uh, yeah? he mentioned Lucky Pokemon was coming to Pokemon Go, and sure as crap, yes it was. Uh, the good news is Lucky Pokemon is a thing. It's awesome. The bad news is, unfortunately, it's not completely free in the Stardust. The Stardust is very yeah. reduced, and the only way you can really get it, it looks like, instead of catching it, it has to be traded right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which it makes sense because traded Pokemon and real, you know, mainstream Pokemon games get a, a experience boost. Mm-hmm. However, uh, they announced it, and then people started trading like crazy, and the, the you know the hundreds, thousands of trades, not one single lucky Pokemon. They they announced that it was coming out, but then they forgot to mention. Oh wait, actually, we we I know we made an update right here, but it was just a baby update. That was for something <laughs> else. That, that was for a minor bug fix, and then a few days later, they actually let it come out Mm -hmm. so alongside that we got lucky pokemon which have reduced uh stardust rates as well as cool animations in the background and uh we can now gift uh stardust to each other which is a big thing for me wait we can yes (gasps) when you when you get gifts you'll instead of pokeballs and pinat fruits you can get 100 stardust a pop oh i thought you were saying gift stardust as in i can just gift you twenty thousand stardust and i was like (gasps) (laughs) <laughs> oh, no, I mean, if you want to, but I don't know. <laughs> I was my excited soul, just, for a sec. Just grind yeah. for three hours, geez. <laughs> no, unfortunately, uh, no free star dust just yet. However, uh, we got two more weeks left uh, coming up before we got the big EV event, which is the yes. first time I've heard a two-day event. Because, okay, uh, what is this one? I'm not in loop it, for this one. For the it's community, community event. event. Oh, it's okay. going to be Saturday and Sunday. It's EV from 2 to 5 Ooh. p.m. Eastern Standard. Cool. August 11th and August 12th, which right. is it's and to me because you know Evie, it's cool because you know I'll be able to get you know. Excuse me, I'm sorry. You need to you need to retract yeah. that statement, and then take a few steps back, and then think about what you want to say really carefully. Evie, I agree. I agree. Is, um, so I'm maybe, so maybe not stats wise. Maybe not stats wise. The most useful Pokemon's in the game. Evie is a cute. And you need to respect the most that. adorable Pokemons in the game. Look, Vaporeon, gonna... however, is a sta- it's a defense monster. You throw Vaporeon, Vaporeon in there, special def- defense, and just tank everything. It's great. So I'd I'd like you to um, re rephrase that. You're gonna attract your harmful statement, Ty. I, I understand. I'll, I'll try again. <laughs> I would I would happily kick an Eevee into the ditch so I could hug a oh! Pikachu. Oh, but, you're one of those let's go Pikachu people. Oh, gross. Ugh. I know, right? I feel like uh, Nick was going to pull up. Oh, he has a cute. <laughs> Wait, is that a, a Vaporeon? I thought it was a, a, a Stitch at first, but I realized it was a Vaporeon. He just pulled out a Stitch. Vaporeon. Yeah. So, meanwhile, as Uh-oh. he's. Oh, my God, we're going. We're going in. Over up here, you can see up in the top of the roof up there, or yeah. near the top of the wall, I got a Pikachu guarding over the entire house. I see that weak thing over there. That weak thing. I'm sorry. Do you want to. Oh, 
Oh, are we? <laughs> I got an Alolan. Uh, are we gonna go into like video quality? Okay, no. Okay, video. before we do that, this is my uh, my sister gifted me this actually. For my That's birthday. adorbs. My yeah. oh, that's birthday, that's yeah. cute. Yeah. I got an Alolan Vulpix in the other room, but. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Before this gets any worse. Uh, okay. Talk about Pokemon. Too I'll much. back up. Uh, uh, quick question for everybody. Uh, yeah. Favorite evolution? One, two, three. Camp. Oof. Umbreon. Okay. Nick. Glaceon. My favorite was originally Espeon, but I've taken a strong liking to Umbreon 2, yeah. uh, both in terms of style and uh, the fact that it's like more heavy on defense. Yeah, like, it's a tank. Like Because yeah. before, I actually, I used to love Jolteon, and I, I still do, because I love glass cannons. It was quick, it had a strong special attack, wham, bam, straight in. Mm -hmm. However, I realized that when it comes to Pokemon strategy games, strong and quick hitting doesn't always work. Right. But... Espeon was, or sorry, Umbreon was good at because you know you could poison it and then you could do all sorts of cool things that mm -hmm. I really appreciated. Plus, it had a glowing ring at night. Yeah, and uh, stall tactics in Gen two meta were just the most popular. So, oh, it was so nice. Like, yeah. what is the name of the Pokemon in Pokemon Sun and Moon? The uh, underwater Pokemon that apparently preyed on Corsola, and that's the only way you could find it. Oh, Mary uh, Mariane is the English name. I, I, geez, I know these by the Japanese name uh, because I watched the subbed. Uh, but I think it's Mary Mariane or something like that. Uh, that Pokemon in particular, I really enjoyed because it had a, a type of protect where if you struck it while it was protecting yeah. itself, it would poison itself. Mm -hmm. And then I think it actually had protect as well. And you know, it, you could also just do toxic protect, do another crap move protect, and it, it just whittled it and killed itself. And so. I, that was my strategy for Pokemon Sun, actually. So the evolution for Mariani is uh, Toxapex. Yes. Oh, Toxapex. sorry. I was thinking backwards. Yeah. yeah. And it has it has an ability called Merciless, where mm -hmm. it does uh, tripled damage if your opponent's uh, poisoned. So yes. all you got to do is run Toxic and then run Venusaur, because Venusaur does double damage if your opponent's poisoned. So oh, double man. damage times triple damage, and it's basically inst uh, like one hit kills. Jeez. Wait, yeah. do you still have your game? I, I still have my games, yeah. Why aren't we battling each other? I never I never get rid of any of my Pokemon games. Yeah. Like, I have... We, we need to exchange my, friend codes and, like, show I've off I've never teams. done that with anybody, but we could do that, yeah. I, we, I we play alone because none of my friends, until now, play Pokemon, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a lonely nerd. You are lonely in the guild with many friends and companies, so don't worry, buddy. We will have your back. Uh, is there anything else we want to talk about Pokemon Go, or should we leave it back to the pit where it belongs? Leave it back to the pit where kick it belongs. It, kick it like the EV. Because there's right into the balls we'll, of hell. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that later, but I think we can just keep going on and on and on about Pokemon, so I think we should move on. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, final note that I see for the news is uh, PlayStation 4 is entering the final phase of its life cycle, according to Sony. Now, this ties into uh, some talk that I know was mentioned by Cam over in his show in yeah. regards to the future of stream boxes versus all in boxes. Yeah, this was actually so this news came out. Uh, this was an older news story, too, because this this came out like a month or so ago. I remember it was a good few episodes ago that we talked about this. But uh, yeah, PS4 is predicting, well, the next generation of consoles most likely come out in for Sony, of course, 2021 is what they're looking at for PS5 or whatever they call it, but probably PS5. Mind you, though, they, these are just official announcements. I mean, the community and game devs have already been predicting that this is the we're entering like the final phase of life yeah. cycle for all uh, consoles, for yeah. the current gen anyways. Well, we know, actually, we know um, just from rumors this past week and stuff from E3, we know Xbox is working on two devices yeah. and that's coming out 2020. And this is likely coming out 2021, though I suspect, though I suspect that Microsoft might force Sony's hand to try and push it a year earlier. I think that might be a call I'm willing to make that Sony might also go 2020. And uh, that, that was a call I made a while ago without really knowing where I was like, it'll be within three years. Right. But, uh, but I think I'm, you know, seeing things progress. I think that Microsoft has the potential to put Sony in a kind of vice grip situation, even given where they are in the generation right now. And I think they might try and move up their launch uh, because Microsoft could put them in a tough spot, basically. Boy, I can't wait for all those teraflops. Those those teraflops well, are you know they all get those me good. deep cuts too. Don't worry the, about them. The, the deepest of cuts. So hopefully, here's the good thing, right? So hopefully in the next generation, what happens? Because let's be real, the Xbox One X and you know to a lesser extent the PS4 Pro uh, talk about being able to do 4K, and we don't have anything beyond that at this point. So what Phil Spencer said for the next Xbox was they're going to be focusing on CPU because while graphics cards have been pushing ahead in consoles, you know, full force, the CPUs are severely lacking, and of course what that allows for is a lot of different types 
types of uh, gameplay simultaneously, a lot of different NPCs on screen at a time. So my hope is that they kind of go more in on the CPU side of things next gen, keep the video cards around where they need to be right now, where they are with the PS4 Pro, if not like a little tiny bit higher, but like, let's go on CPU, you know, let's get that like 10,000 NPCs on screen at a time going. Like, oh, And then we can stuff. finally see Destiny 3 in 60 FPS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we can get. Please focus on frames per second. Please focus, like, you know, focus on 1080 and frames per second, please. It's 2018. We don't need to yeah. live like peasants. Seriously. We can have 60 <laughs> FPS in game. Seriously. It's amazing. Uh, completely sidebar right here. Nintendo Switch. Yeah. Hyrule Warriors. Yeah. On Wii U, uh, either 26 or 30 FPS. Mm -hmm. Didn't think I noticed it that much. No. Came out on the Switch, 60 FPS. Mm -hmm. Huge difference. Yeah, Nintendo but does it. I am a believer after that because I was like, eh, it's not that big of a deal. You know, twice the, like, I can see it just fine. Everything's moving. No, things are different. Big deal. It needs to be a big deal. You need big to deal. see the smoothness. It's not, unless, like, my brain is intoxicated, which often it is. Yep. I, I can notice this now. Like, if things are like, oh man, this seems kind of choppy, it's like, you got to try harder. Mm -hmm. I, I, like, what would you sacrifice more, graphic quality or frame rates? Graphic oh, quality. Always graphic quality. And that's 100%. Among people who play games a ton, I feel like it's the far majority opinion. So, beautiful game at 30 FPS is not nearly as enjoyable as a decent looking game at 60. Yeah. To a large extent, yes, but it also depends on the genre. And I know we're going to go into this in a bit. But, <laughs> like, specifically for shooters, you need high frame rate. Yeah, you definitely you do. need to be precise. Um, be it like okay maybe pve shooters not so much but pvp shooters yes uh, pve shooters you would need to be precise if it's like more down to speed running right because then you'd want to make sure that you're getting and clipping through everything and getting in you know whatever positions as fast as you can but for pvp games you need the high frame rate yep and uh speaking of actually microsoft's plans for next gen they're making those two systems right the stream box and the traditional console that's another thing for competitive games is stream box latency issues which they're attempting to fix but you're never going to fix it to a point where it's not going to where it's not going to hinder the game so anyone attempting to do a competitive game you can't do the stream box option you can't no Let's way say even even a microsoft dumped as much money as they wanted to into that yeah, it's not well, even their fault at that point it's usually at the fault of the internet providers it's science and, fault it's science fault that we talk about here's the thing in the fighting game community right milliseconds matter and so oh, if yeah. we're talking a controller input to a console versus sending an input to the internet and then it's sending back the information no way it doesn't matter how fast the internet is you need horrible entanglement for what they want <laughs> like uh microsoft would have to google or google it would have to partner with google at this point just uh guarantee like hey we need google internet gigabit level internet in order to have this kind of input and even then i don't even think a gigabyte would be enough for that level of perfect and it doesn't fix things in the user end either because they still need to get back to them through their connections and that's the thing you know japan it's interesting really because microsoft's going for this option sony i don't know they're in a position to make a mistake i'll, I'll say that much we can talk about it well, I mean, they all are in a position to make a mistake it's just how bad it's it, well it's the thing where basically long story short um everybody generations have been switching somewhat because everybody had a chance to make a terrible mistake and shoot themselves in the foot at the beginning of a generation but everyone's been through that cycle once at this point so we're like you know nintendo with the wii u of course and and earlier the virtual boy and so xbox with the xbox and the xbox 360 and kind of the <laughs> xbox one no xbox with the xbox one primarily and then uh, xbox though. 360 they sold enough but the red ring attack was a problem but uh ps you know sony with the ps3 everyone's made a huge mistake once so now we'll see if they've learned but somebody yeah. could be like we're gonna make a stream box and nothing else and then it's like <laughs> just laugh at them it's, huh? I, I I don't know what to say about it because honestly, it's like it would be nice, but at the same time, it's we're we're ahead of our time at this point. Yeah, yeah, way way ahead of our time. Yep. Japan has an internet infrastructure that could potentially handle stream streaming games, but not here. Yeah, not maybe. most places. Not most places. And I mean, even if they didn't have it, it wouldn't matter because you don't have to worry like, about thirty Xbox Twos at that point with yeah. how many people love. Microsoft. Well, I mean, in Japan, you do have to worry about exactly 30 Xbox twos because that's all they'll sell. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. I've yeah. checked. Halo 3 confirmed. <laughs> yep. So, topic of the show, the big one right here. Guys, what are our favorite video game genres? Oh, yeah. <sighs> There's so many out there. We have a few that we enjoy. There's some that we'll dabble with. There's some that we hate. 
but there's always that one that we just we love. Yep. We we couldn't give it up. Nick, what's what's your favorite genre? Um, it started off so m- my first ever game that I can ever remember playing was Crash Bandicoot 2 on the P- uh, PlayStation One. Really, so Cortez for the- Revenge, I believe yes. it's called, or Cortexes. So for the longest time, my um, my favorite game genre was like a platformer. Um, so from there, I leaped on to like a lot of the other Crash games because my parents deemed that to be child friendly and bought me those games primarily. And then when I uh, became older, I moved down to Naughty Dog Classics because I fell in love with Ratchet and Clank, um, which was part of Insomniac Games. And then I fell I in love. Say, with, I was... uh, yeah, no, I know I confused it. So <laughs> I, was gonna say, I meant to say Jack and Daxter before I got into Insomniac. So now uh, we're talking Sparrow. I never actually got around to playing Spyro. I That's played like a, so there was a demo that you could activate before, like at the start screen of Crash Bandicoot Three, and I played that a couple of times all the way through. Was that the first one, like first Spyro demo? I think it was the second. I'm not sure because that was ages ago. There was a um, demo that you could do by inputting a special code on Crash Team Racing that would allow you to play a level of uh, Spyro Two, uh, Ripto's Rage. So it might have been Spyro Three, maybe because this was. Or I, I, I'm not entirely sure on the time. I'm going to take a wild guess and say Crash Team Racing came after Crash Bandicoot, the first game, so... <laughs> no, it came after clear. the second one because okay. there was two There was two Crash Racing games. My Crash Team Racing was the second one. Um, okay. Anyway, so yeah, so Crash Bandicoot, Jack and Daxter, Ratchet and Clank were some of my favorite game, uh, games on the PlayStation 1 and the PlayStation 2 growing up. Um, and then I discovered Shooters with Halo on the PC. My friend bought over a CD one day. We down we a path some, uh, I could not follow. PC called, Halo. Oh, okay. Yeah, we call, we, it was called Hardee's for us. And I think that's called Charlie's Jr. Or Chuck oh, Jr. Um, like what, the, no. the fast food chain with the yeah, star. Yeah, yeah Hardee's. Uh, Carl yeah, Jr. So, Carl Jr. Jr. Yeah. yeah, so for us, it's called Hardee's. That's what mm-hmm. it's branded as in yeah. uh, the Middle East. Um, and so bought home some burgers. He bought, bought over his uh, Halo, Halo 1 Combat Evolved on PC. And I fell in love with the game. And since then, it's always been shooters, um, f- first person shooters specifically. Um, and as it's obvious by the games that I play every week, and I've talked about Overwatch, Destiny 2, Destiny 1, Titanfall 2, uh, Fortnite is not a first person shooter, but a shooter nonetheless. Um, Halo 5, which I really enjoyed from a gameplay point of view. Um, that's probably my current favorite genre, and I don't think it's going to change. Um, I enjoy plat. I-, I really miss platformers. Um, like that old school, Jack, like Ratchet and Clank was some of my, was my favorite games. I played Ratchet and Clank four. It was a good game. Uh, I played it probably over six, seven times. Started the game over, and I was the best amongst my friends in that How game. How about uh, Jack and Dexter? I never played the first one, but two, three, four X and fi- Last Frontier. I played the crap out of those I was, games. I was waiting for you to say racing as well. Oh right, yeah, no, Jack X, yeah, that's uh, the racing one. Oh, okay. My bad. Yeah, my bad. My bad. Yeah, I played the crap out of that one too. So I, I enjoy a few uh, racing games every now and then, but first person shooters is my go to. The one genre I hate, and I've talked about this vehemently on a show before, are MOBAs. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot stand MOBAs. So League of Legends after this, right? I can w- I can watch MOBAs. Dota 2, boys. I can I watch know. LOL and Dota. Like, I can watch tournaments. I mean, my roommate have sat down and done that, but I can't play them. It drives me insane to play them. I Okay. I mean, I understand that because uh, it has a high skill ceiling, so I wouldn't want to hurt your pretty little heart trying to play it's a not game even like about, that. It's not about the skill ceiling. It's not about, like, the mechanics, the numbers. It's just, I just can't stand, like, the gameplay of it. Like, it just doesn't appeal to me. Oh, trust me. I hate Creeper Score like a son of a gun. Like, it drives me wild that my main focus is I got to kill these little minions for 20 minutes straight so I can get cool stuff and finally oh, do something. Again, it's not even about, see, I can't explain it. It's not even about that. Like, I understand that to, like, whatever specific MOBA it is, but it's just MOBAs themselves as a whole. Like, it just, it just puts me off. <laughs> I wonder, uh, like, backtracking a little bit, a real-time strategy, Warcraft 3, if you'd be okay with something like that. I never played Warcraft 3. I used to play a lot of Age of Empires 2. I used to put, I put a lot of, but never online. I like playing against the AI because yeah, I'm too. scared. I'm scared to play against other people. I'm not good enough for that. Right. So I'd go into like Age of Empires 2 specifically, uh, hit enter, turn on the, you know, put in all the cheats to get as much wood, meat, yeah. gold as I wanted. Get yeah. like the, where's, get, my like, where's my car? Where's my car? Where's my car? Yeah, really the, the four cobras laser, driving around with laser, machine guns. Laser beam uh, bear. Uh, it was great. Yeah. Oh, geez. Uh, the reason why I mentioned Warcraft 3 is because it's a real-time strategy game where it gives you um, building bases and all that right. stuff. But it's the first Warcraft game that I played, anyways, that introduced uh, heroes. You could, you know, focus on heroes. Right, right. Um, was, what was it called? Age of Mythology. 
that followed a similar thing. Yes, yeah, Age of Mythology had yes. like heroes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Oh man, I haven't thought about that game in a while. <laughs> so that uh your favorite genre is shooters. Your least favorite would be mobile style games. Yeah. What about you, Cam? What what's All your right. favorite genre? Anyone want to go? Yes. Buckle in, boys. <laughs> uh it's not that difficult <laughs> horror games horror oh games. yeah oh yeah no nah. so of course my favorite genre is rpgs as a whole and that's actually so the inspiration for it uh much like it was the inspiration for you when, when you started playing for me so i grew up uh so a little backstory but uh, i'm a bastard child fun enough so i had both my parents never married so two separate households so as a kid i was traveling a lot wait 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 yep so, because you're in the states, what would that make you? That would that would make you a sand or a snow. What would that make you? A sand oh, or a snow? I'm like, okay. Do you smell toast, Nick? Can you guys, don't get the reference? Reference? guys don't get the Game of Thrones reference. Oh no, that's not anime, oh, dude. I can't oh, help geez. you. You know that. <laughs> oh, what's it called? That's Western anime. Uh, yeah. So, so the joke being basically, or not not the joke, but basically, Can't in snow. effect, I was traveling a lot. So I had a predisposition to handheld. So that's one thing, right? Is I always had to be a handheld player because I was always on the move, going between houses, going places. And RPGs were the pick for me. One, because it was some of the first games I played. First game I ever played was like Duck Hunt Mario on the NES. But after that, Pokemon Blue. And the nice thing about RPGs at the time compared to other games was you could save much more frequently in Game Boy RPGs because of the, you know, the internal batteries. So the tiniest when, amount of progress and you can still yeah. save and keep it. So when I, I was on the move, I forgot to talk about my Game Boy Advance and Pokemon. Yeah, Emerald. yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that was the thing of my childhood too. Can yeah, I? when when I'm on the move, so if I was playing a Mario game and I was in the middle of a level, and I don't have any recourse. I have to lose that progress, and I hate losing progress more than anything else. Mm. I hate it. So RPGs were the natural fit because I could, you know, play them a little bit, like Donna Souls on Game Boy Advance, Final Fantasy One and Two. You play a little bit, you save. Pokemon, you play a little bit, you save. So anything that allowed me to save at any point was what I was drawn towards. But eventually it just became a like for, or I should say my gaming sense developed as a sit and think kind of gamer, where rather than, you know, intense action, I like having the opportunity to, to explore strategy. I like being able to sit there, which is why I hate the ATB systems in later Final Fantasies, because I like being like, okay, turn-based game. What are my options? What's the most effective option? I want to think about that game. And I want to also experience a story. Um, so I do like other things that have stories as well. But uh, yeah, RPGs for me is most favorite. Least favorite might be, might be. It's hard because I don't hate any genre outright. Uh, definitely. Well, you won't play a horror game last I checked. Right. So I won't play them. That doesn't mean I hate them. I won't play them because I'm terrified. of Least them. favorite though. But, but I also it's like the horror is more the theme rather than like the kind of game. Yeah. Like the game mechanics, right? Yeah. Like I yeah. want to play like exactly. Dead Space yeah. is like, I would play it if the horror themes weren't there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And so I can deal with some horror too, as long as it's just not just space station just for fun. Yeah. As the, long the as the it's not scared, I'm like, good. He, he keeps commenting about how well the air conditioning is working fully functioning. Yeah, but uh yeah, as long as no jump scares, I'm good with that. So maybe so, pr so certain puzzle games are my least favorite and maybe certain pure platformers. Because uh puzzle games, I just I'm bad with spatial stuff. I really am. It's ironic because I'm a geographer, but I'm really bad with like, uh, this goes here, this goes here. So puzzle games, I'm just not good at. And so I just hated playing them always, uh, but I do respect them. And I like, I like certain things that are light on it. So like, if you ever see like indie puzzle platformer, I will generally never play those games ever. Like, no, I will avoid at all costs. Uh, the other so thing, Woody pop girls, uh, wouldn't be your thing. No, see, I got better options if I want to do, you know, hentai. Let's you got real. plenty of options. I got, I got VNs, <laughs> man. But uh, yeah, other one, probably pure platformers that are just about difficulty. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not reaction time. I don't have the reaction time often to deal with those. So mostly for lack of skill on my part is why I dislike things. Um, there's no genre I incredibly hate. I, I do get around to things, but yeah, mostly for lack of skill. But yeah, that's me. This conversations make me like remember all the other games. So like I completely forgot to mention the amount of time I put into Pokemon, um, like across a Game Boy Advance and then the Nintendo DS Lite, which my sister broke because I was sitting on the couch and she threw a remote at me, aiming for my head, but it hit my DS screen and cracked the LCD screen. Oh! No, you 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 get rid of your sister. How are you still alive? <laughs> Why aren't you in prison? Yeah. Why isn't she in prison? And my Why mom was sitting right there too. Her? 
My mom was sitting right there as my sister threw a remote at me, aiming for my head, but it hit my Nintendo DS. <laughs> and my mom and I were just kind of like, what, what, why? <laughs> why would you do that? Yeah. And then uh, it was good because my mom felt bad enough and she bought me the 3DS. Oh, uh, and okay. I had the fourth side. Yeah, I had the foresight to get... So I grew up in the Middle East, and all of our game systems are PAL there. Yes, right? Not yes. NTSC. So I had the foresight to buy an NTSC 3DS so mm-hmm. that when I came over here, I would be able to like play games uh, normally. Because yeah, I, right. I was around the time when I was planning to come over to Canada. So um, you also then, if, if everything was in PAL, then you also had the 50 hertz TVs for... Um, that's what I, I think. guess because your plugs are different. Yeah, if, well, yeah, 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 sixty versus fifty. So your frame rates were a little bit different than ours, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like so, I have my PS2 sitting here, and I have to buy. I actually have to buy a transformer to be able mm-hmm. to get that to work because the input voltage requirement is one hundred and ten, not two twenty, which is the yeah. standard from uh, um, in North America. Yeah. Um, and I also forgot about the Prince of Persia games. The original, yeah, no, not, I, not like the eight um, bit uh, Prince of Persia games, mm-hmm. not the MS DOS games. The you know. Uh, Sands of Time, Warrior yep. Within, and Two Thrones. Those were some of my favorite games ever. Mm-hmm. So actually, good question. In terms of console releases, uh, being from the Middle East, did you get things a little bit later in terms of like releases? Did things come a couple years after or right on time? I actually have no idea. Okay. Um, okay. Not at least until towards the, um, you know, uh, as I was like late, in, towards my late teens. I never yeah. paid attention to it when I was younger. I know like a lot of the Nintendo systems weren't the norm. Mm-hmm. It was mostly PlayStation. Yeah. Um, so that's part of why I never had the Nintendo experience. Uh, right. Per se. Right. Um, the handhelds were pretty popular. That's why we got a lot of the Game Boys. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so as things went, as things uh, progress and develop, we started getting things just about roughly the same time. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, I All guess right. we covered everybody. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's go down over out of this one. Well, Tyler, how about you? Bud, what, what do what you, you like? Favorite genres. What do you like? <sighs> so. When I was a child, I was in the same boat as Cam. I really liked my RPGs. Uh, you know, had plenty of time. Spend ahead, you know, spend ahead. A- I love how I keep saying spend and had at the same time. Yeah, spend it's ahead. Good. It's good. I spent ahead a good time with them. But I realized as I grew, it would probably be around high school. In fact, I'm not even sure if I told the story before, but I'm going to do it real quick. I I played a horror game, Resident Evil, the first one for the PlayStation, one time at a friend's house just for funs and giggles. And I couldn't understand the tank controls. And the first time you encounter a zombie, I didn't know what to do. He came, bit me, and I was so terrified that I mashed the open of the PlayStation instead of the power and just left the spin, you know, it like bit at me. And but then game was frozen. So I had to sit there with that imprinted on my memory. And that scarred me for a very long time with horror games. I, uh, I'm a big scaredy cat. However, I to this day, I Same. realize. When it comes to video games, I don't feel emotion all that much. When it comes to like uh, progress, I get excited. When it comes to like uh, percentage chances, and I win that percentage chance, like uh, percent, you know, a legendary loot drop or something like that. And when numbers go up, I get a uh, feeling of smug satisfaction and then excitement when I, you know, realized I hit the jackpot. There was a chance I couldn't get it, but fate shined on me. Respect. Oh. However, that happens far in and in between when it comes to RPGs because it's like, oh, I got a level. Cool. But then, you know, the fleeting moment's gone. But there is one genre that instills a particular emotion in me every single time that I have it, you know, let it happen. And that is horror games and fear. I It's surprising how well a horror game can terrify me almost instantly just by atmosphere alone. And the idea that a game can make me feel alive for all the horrible wrong reasons is exhilarating and i realized that even though i'm terrified in the games it makes me feel brave i i i'm invested in this like i am scared out of my mind that there's something in here that shouldn't be but i am going to go against it and take it on and then when i do and i'm rewarded with running for my life for about 30 seconds i feel vindicated it's like wow i can't believe i just did that and in high school the first game i played ever since that resident evil game was dead space and time and time again, you know, the fun game gets uh, mentioned up. Uh, I believe I talked about this on a previous podcast with uh, specifically with Cam. I was playing with uh, my best friend, Nick, who had a uh, big Sony TV and uh, PS3 and we're hiding in a room for a very long time. And one of the games that came up during that time was Dead Space. And Nick looked at me and was like, 
do you want to play this game i'm like i'm not good with horror games he's like neither am i but we we should do it and we like kind of bros uh crossed arms and all that stuff and i was like on one condition if we get a score of an eight or higher, because I don't want to play a bad horror game. I don't, I don't want to scar myself again. We'll look it up. It's an 8.5. So I'm like, crap. So we go to the GameStop, grab it. We play it. It was supposed to be take turns, but ended up, ended up being me playing the entire thing, which was interesting. And we were terrified. Now, I realized playing with a friend, it kind of dampens the atmosphere a little bit because, you know, you, you lose the... Uh, the sensation of being by yourself you're screwed you're all alone there's bad things coming all around you and you don't know where they are but it just made such a huge impression on me that i just i loved it and so when i got to play dead space 2 dead space 3 alien isolation is another good one heck even more recently hellblade sinuous sacrifice which uh not a really a news article but it's uh, getting a vr release coming out for the htc vive yep separate complete game by itself which is kind of frustrating because not only did the company get bought out by Microsoft after because it came out on the PS4 and I was like, OK, Xbox fellow friends play this game. You're going to love it. And Microsoft's like, we love it so much. We're going to you know, we we have tasted the apple. We're going to buy the whole dang tree and Microsoft money. Go. <laughs> I, know, right? yeah. I, just, I, I love that. Even to this day, 27 years old, I can still get terrified from a game just by audio and optical sensory. And that's fantastic for me because uh, there's a lot of games like Persona and whatnot. You know, I'm enjoying numbers going up and ranks going up and stuff, but it's like, cool. And then it's a fleeting second, but Dead Space or any other horror game could leave an impression on me for hours. Like, holy crap, my heart is still racing from that. That was so fun and scary. And that's why I say horror is probably my favorite genre because I'm a big chicken. And because of that, it has the greatest impact on me. Sweet. As for least favorite, yeah, what do you hate? I don't know. I'm trying to. Oh well, actually, no, I do know. It's shooters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because uh, I used to be that guy that I, as soon as I had the PlayStation Three, I started buying Call of Duty. I so, said, you know, I started coming that dude bro shooter and all that stuff, and I was just, you know, yeah. And I, as I told Cam, and I wasn't joking. My name for the on the PlayStation Three was Tycho Duh D A. Sniper oh, God, no, and it's like even I'm like, that's oh my crazy. sweet summer child, <laughs> I know, yeah, right? Oh. It's like, please let <laughs> my name. Thanks. But I, I love having the Barrett 50 cal in the original Call of Duty for uh, Modern Warfare, and that was my thing. And I think it was Modern Warfare Two that happened. I was in uh, college at that point. I was playing it like crazy. I had my roommate play a little bit with me on the co-op missions. And all of a sudden, the disc reader just took a huge dump. I'm like, oh, it's gone. It's dead. Okay. I can't play any more disc-based games anymore. This is very, very sad. And suddenly, the only thing I had left was my GameCube. And so suddenly, Nintendo made a huge return in my life because I couldn't afford to replace my PS3 uh, disc reader. And as I'm sure you can guess, the only uh, shooter that I was aware of on the GameCube was Metroid Prime. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that game as a shooter, but I didn't get back into, uh, you know, the chances of playing shooters until Halo. But even then, I didn't like playing a uh, shooter all that much because it was a fun skill to have or it felt like uh, I had to be skilled. But there was always that one other person across the map. It always felt like he was smoking a cigar and he was having moderate uh sexual content with my mother every single time and it was very frustrating and it's like <laughs> this is not the type of people i want to be associated with and that alone started pushing me away from shooters just like oh man i don't want to be a dude bro a guy you know i'm cool look at me i got oh whoops sorry Oops. that's real cool <laughs> i have yeah I'm, I'm so cool that i i boom my mic like crazy with beautiful like a nice beautiful glorious beard thick uh black glasses and a nice wavy hair and you know maybe my favorite game is destiny 2 can't forget the fedora oh yeah, and the fedora yeah. mm-hmm. i never seen the other fedora nick anyways never will oh yeah <laughs> so yeah suitors not for me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I mean yeah. i'll play it if it's fun with friends but by myself it's something i was happy to give up uh back in high school yeah so how funny enough how i got into shooters i never had like any so uh, I went from the PS2 to the Xbox 360, but I'd never had like Xbox Live until I came to Canada. Huh. Like I never had Xbox Live growing up, so I never played online until I came to Canada and I had Halo 4. And that's when I put a lot of time into Halo 4 PvP. And 
that's when I really got invested. Not into like shooters specifically, but competitive play. So mm-hmm. I remember very clearly going into the SWAT playlist that Halo had, where it's uh, you just get the rifle. It was called the DMR or the pistol, um, the the Magnum, which was the most overpowered pistol in the entire existence of all games. Oh yeah, the um, plasma pistol plus the uh, regular pistol. Just no, no, just it. the regular pistol, like the starting pistol. It's the most overpowered game in all Destiny, like all Halo games, without a doubt. Hmm. Because uh, you can uh, quite easily take down somebody's shields and then shoot them in the head. But the SWAT game mode didn't have um, shields. So all you had to do was aim at the head, one shot, and it was a kill. Um, and so that's where I really got my competitive spirit, where I was like, yes, I shot that guy in the head first before he shot me in the head. I wasn't good with snipers, mind you, but I was good with the rifles. I shot that guy in the head before he shot me in the head. I win. I'm better. Let's find the next person. And I and I wish I could record all of that now because I went on crazy, like, 15, 20 kill montage, like, sprees, just, like, slaughtering everybody. I'm like... Yeah. This is what it's like to be good at something. And then I came to Destiny where everybody was better than me. I'm like, okay, I'm not that great. Um, I'll just sit here with my friends. A right upside uh, note to uh, what you said there about recording yourself. Did you guys ever record yourselves when you were a kid? No. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, okay. So Cam had a, like a, oh, boy, this is to be a stage of my life. Go ahead. No. Uh, so there's a secret. There's a secret that I, I tout around in the uh, other podcast, too, where there are videos. There are some videos, not of me. But of me and my friends, like vocally playing games, like there's some early proto let's plays, pseudo let's plays, mm-hmm. I'd say. But YouTube they're one offs for specific games, and they're still around on YouTube. Uh, and they were, I still actually, I still think they're okay. I still think some of the jokes hold up. I'm like, yeah, I'm down. But it was from <laughs> God. I was in. No, it wasn't too too long ago either. I was like 10th grade at the time, so it was you know like 2009, 2010. Um, but. Yeah, other than that, I recorded myself, but nothing uploaded online. No video game recording myself um, prior to that. So get this, back in uh, the early 90s, I think even before YouTube became a thing. Yeah, it would have had to be, yeah. Well, not early 90s. I would say late 90s. Mm -hmm. A couple of years of Ocarina of Time came out. Mm -hmm. I learned and discovered that if I plugged in my Nintendo 64 through my VCR, I could record anything that goes through it. Oh, and so I recorded myself playing Ocarina of Time, just doing random stuff, running around for six hours. And I would use that videotape to fall asleep to Ocarina of Time. Yo, that's good. That's and comfy. It, it was fantastic. Just yeah. the idea of like waking up, like, oh, I know exactly where I'm at right now. It was also funny because I would not do a single temple because I was because the temples I had to do was uh, the Shadow Temple. Mm-hmm. And that is scary as heck. So, yeah, there's like a 30 second clip of me walking in and then immediately tell <laughs> I wouldn't do it. That's good. But uh, I guess the most notable thing is uh, before uh, Let's Playing Days, I recorded myself using the GameCube the entire playthrough of uh, Paper Mario at the Thousand Year Door. Oh, nice. Uh, the entire thing on like eight nine separate uh vcr tapes <laughs> and so i had this nice pile of vcr tapes i put into a cardboard box i printed out the cover art for uh, paper mario a thousand year door put it on put it on the back and saying this is my greatest work ever nice. please enjoy <laughs> it if this ever falls in your hands and uh this happened in the basement of my grandmother's house bless her and then when I went out for college, apparently what she did, she took one of the tapes so she could record over it with her soap opera. No! And just broke my heart. <laughs> no! That I still was bad. I still got my like DBZ VHS recordings in the in the closet over here and nice. stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah, like <sighs> that and uh she sold off my Harry Potter books while I when after I moved out, and it's like Oof. That could, that, I know it's like, man, grandma, what are you Oof. doing to me? This is my childhood, you're killing me here. Grandma, please. And but anyway, I, I think doing that is why I wanted to become a Let's Player because I realized I love, and this is narcissistic, I love watching myself play a game after I'm done playing it, just to <laughs> review how I did. But yes, uh, <laughs> favorite genres, people, and uh, hey, least favorite. Hey, let's wrap up the show because this is probably our, actually it is our longest yeah. episode yet, unless we uh, slept two of the previous ones together. That was a big day. It was a good topic. Game releases this week uh, out on August 1st, which is going to be uh, around the time that you guys hear this. I think that's Tuesday, actually. It could be yes. mistaken. Tuesday or Wednesday. I think. No, so, it's Wednesday. Okay. So on Wednesday, uh, Yakuza 0 is coming out for the PC. It's already out for the PS4, but if you uh, don't have a PS4, like a certain someone, and you really want to try the first Yakuza game, 100% recommend. Great yep. game. Uh, on August 2nd, two games are coming out of notable quality. 
uh, Iconoclast and Sultan Sanctuary, both coming out from the Nintendo Switch. Uh, both uh, games I have no idea about, so I can't really give a recommendation. Sultan Sanctuary has a lot of uh, Dark Souls style mechanics in it. I don't know too much about Iconoclast, though. Great hot sell for me. Mm-hmm. And then finally, and this is probably my biggest thing, uh, it gives me very strong mixed feelings because Why Are You Aware Gold is coming out oh, on yeah. August 3rd, which would be Thursday technically then for the 3DS. There's something important about this game that people need to know about. What is that? That, that I didn't know about until somebody told me. So apparently, this is very important. Apparently, you can record yourself with the 3DS and redub the voice lines in the game with your own voice, which really? is very important <laughs> considering what you could do with that. Like you could just like start spouting vulgar nonsense and it would use it as a line. Mm-hmm. As it was told to me, you could basically redub the game. Nice as a feature. Yeah. That would be. It, it just bugs <laughs> yeah. me because I love WarioWare and I understand WarioWare originally came out on handheld consoles, the Game Boy Advance, the Nintendo DS, I believe. And uh, I played it on GameCube and then on the Wii. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I loved it on the consoles. Playing it with the Wii was the best thing ever. It was so smart the way they did things. And so I don't know how they would do it, but I feel like the Joy-Cons would be perfect for this. Yeah. With no aim and sensitivity, but it's coming out for the 3DS because uh-huh. they want to keep that pillar alive, even though it needs to burn and die, just like the Vita and the Wii U. I've been saying it. Oh, hold on now. <laughs> <laughs> You've been saying it. Go ahead. Yes. I, Here I, comes I, another hour-long section yeah, yeah. about the PS Vita and how it's a national treasure and how it we is. must forever cherish it, it and is. actually remake it and launch the PS Vita XD. Do it again. No, do ben it again. Franklin <laughs> was here today in this day and age. He might have said the turkey as the national bird but i feel like he would have attached wings to the vita and made that the bird instead <laughs> more so he would have been forced by me at gunpoint to do that so oh wow you're gonna point a gun at the guy in the hundred dollar bill huh oh yeah that's it, the new that's the new tagline ps vita cam's wet dream yeah so if it makes it feel better the vita does have wings around it now because it's dead no it's over there i got two oh uh, uh, what's it called so a halo theme huh and halo theme. Uh, yeah, no, 3DS should be dead. That, that's all I was going to say, as I've been saying for a while, 3DS should really be dead. It's it's kind of, un, I think it's unreasonable on Nintendo's part, especially considering uh, we did have a period where there was um, not a Switch game drought, but people were feeling for Switch games, where why don't just have this one pillar? I know 3DS is selling, makes sense, but you could just have all developers make games for Switch, and you'd have so much. You'd have so much. I mean, Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, they made the right choice there. It's out on both. Yeah, yeah, do that. And I mean, I understand it might have been a little bit different because WarioWare requires different uh, inputs when it comes to controller use, mm-hmm. and it would have to be completely different. Like I understand WarioWare is probably, or sorry, WarioWare Gold is going to be touchscreen heavy, which means if you wanted to play WarioWare on the Switch, you would probably have to have it undocked. Hey, but- crazy idea! You know, it'd be great and smart, and I can't believe they didn't do this. Why wasn't One Two Switch a WarioWare game? <laughs> Could have easily been. Yeah. And. Uh, I also want to point out that I guess WarioWare Gold is the second highest game to use uh, Amiibo input. So you can the use only, a lot. The only, the only thing before we go off on another huge rant or sidetrack. I'd rather is, not either. Don't. Yeah, but the only thing I can yeah, think of that would make no, sense is purely because of the price point of the systems. The, the 3DS or the 2DS XL yeah. is considerably cheaper than the Switch. So it makes more sense. Not more sense, but it, it, it can easily reach more people. If the counter your resist. point then if you're saying the price point captain toad treasure tracker is 40 bucks both on the switch and the 3ds so oh he's saying console and console point? specifically the console price point uh 3ds is cheaper than the switch oh yeah what i would say though i mean you can okay. even get down to the 2ds being 70 dollars. but what i would say is what they're mistaken is the fact that yes people have um have 3ds's nobody's looking to buy new ones so much right now they're still selling well but uh my point more so being that the active user base of all those 3ds's is very low because nobody's oh, yeah. using oh, yeah. theirs anymore yeah, yeah. unless it's for pokemon right or smash yeah yeah so uh the switch is where they want that to be so they should yeah. make games for that system because if they just you know expect the switch to sell on on because it's a switch like I, they're making games for it, so they're not doing that. But please stop the 3DS, please, or just or just only put ports on it. You know what I mean? Like only put mm-hmm. smaller games and ports, like they've been doing, like the Bowser's um, Inside Story. You know that sort of thing. The remake Mario and Luigi remakes. That's fine, but yeah, don't worry aware. Don't. <laughs> anyways, 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 anyways. Let's wrap it up because uh, this show is is almost turning into a two hour show at this rate. But that's yeah. okay. We had fun. That's all that mattered. Yeah. We're having fun. Yeah, you, you I'm suffering. You're, 
Yeah, it's like playing a video. Well, you're gonna you, suffer you, every week, Cam. Uh, no choice. About I'm gonna it. die. You can I email us Fortnite after this. <laughs> at casualmasterquest at gmail.com or hit us up on Twitter at MasterQuestPod. <laughs> All the podcasts and gaming can be found on our YouTube channel as well as Cam and Nick's channels, which we'll be mentioning very soon. And we'll link uh, the main show on Twitter as often as we can. Uh, I myself as Tyler. My name's Tyler Vidito. You can find me on Twitter at two times Tyler. Also, check me out. I was on the Delvin Cox Experience, which is a apparently top dog uh, podcast like out on itunes i believe it was like number five for uh entertaining podcast it, it, it was huge up there were you and on last week recently or i was on uh about five weeks ago oh okay yeah that and he, he held on to my show like like he was afraid to release it like i was gonna <laughs> spit fire and on the show I, I talk a little bit about psvg i talk about how i uh, came to be with casual master quest gave us a uh, quite a bit of shilling then i talked about our uh, wedding and honeymoon about all the fun stuff detailed with that. Also, uh, just shilling one last time, since I'm actually sober this at this point, because exactly one week ago, I had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Almost exactly. I uh, made a team with uh, Kevin Austin over at PSVG. We made a cool little special called The History of Nintendo. Talks about, uh, yeah, as the title says, Episode The History of one. Nintendo. Episode 1, because there is so much more. We, we start as far back as 1889, and we go even further back mentioning about bands of playing cards in Japan. Because apparently gambling is bad, and you, you, <laughs> you love doing bad things. Yeah, I was going to say, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know it looking at pachinko machines, but... Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Nick, where can we find you? You can find me on Twitter at LRWarrior11, also on my Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash LRWarrior11. Nice. Cam? Yeah. You can find me on Twitter at Cam Collects, on Twitch, on twitch.tv slash Cam Collects. Uh, my schedule's on there. I'm not going to be long-winded. Look at that. You can also check out my other podcast at IntoTheVideoGame.com. All right. Fair enough. Uh, for some reason, I have it typed in here. I have no idea if this is going to happen, and if it doesn't, I'll just edit this out, but potentially we'll be doing a side quest interviewing Cam. Yeah, so this is weird. So let's let's clarify. This is actually good for the end here. So what happened was we were talking. You were drunk last week. Yes. And uh, after the episode, uh, we were talking. Further. During <laughs> the last quiz, I had a very small amount of Everclear in a container, during which I started sipping in the ha- ha- last half of the show, which eventually caused me to go from completely sober to flat out drunk and afraid to admit it. And it just went downhill so quickly. I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So Tyler then comes to me afterwards and he said he like, wanted arm to arm the shoulder. Me. Hey, man. Can I yeah. you? Hey, I have no idea what that means. I just reminded him because he's like, what are we doing this week? I'm like, you said while drunk you were going to interview me. So I don't, hang out with I don't know what that is. It doesn't have to be anything. I just, that's the story. All right. We'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that was episode number 12. Thank you for listening. Uh, you know, you can go anywhere you want, but you can't stay here in the guild hall. I'm sorry. You might have to leave soon. Uh, enjoy your last moments in the, uh, not in the fire, but near the fire. I mean, in the fire, if that's your thing. If yeah, that's your thing. You know, with 2018, we don't kink shame. Yeah. yeah. Or, yep. Anyways, don't forget, enjoy yourselves and to never stop the grind. See you guys later. Bye bye. Love Peace. you. Love you. Love you. Find more of our work by searching for Casual Master Quest on iTunes, Google Play, and other podcast players. Check out what we'll be doing next week on Twitter at MasterQuestPod.